You are listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb going to slide down them big hills, you know what I mean, on the big, nice, burgundy snowboard. Okay, here we go. Again, we're back at the bomb hole, which is presented by Pub Beer and Liquid Death. Now, Stony Buds, what's happened? How we doing, my friend? So good, my dog. God, I love hearing that. Just kind of like music to my ears. <laughs> really excited about today's guest. To my left, we have Jess Kimura. Jess, what's happening? Not too much, just uh, staying cool. Nice. Where'd you, uh, where did you come in from today? Temple Square. <laughs> <laughs> from, down, from downtown. From downtown Salt Lake. And then previous to coming from downtown Salt Lake, where did you come from? I was in Mexico. Yeah. Okay, let's just jump right into it. Now, I know your nickname is Danger Pony, but uh, I heard you had a great nickname in high school. Um. Yeah, it was when uh, the Spice Girls were around. <laughs> so. Major. Let's give them a little air horn, huh? Give the Spice Girls an air horn. I yeah, love that. I back them. Um, it was Dumpster Spice. Dumpster Spice. So that's the what is that? The fifth? The fifth member? The s- sixth, sixth, maybe. maybe. Sixth. Yeah. Sixth. Okay. Yeah, Dumpster. I wish they had a Dumpster Spice. That okay. would be pretty tight. <laughs> Good addition. <laughs> Actually, I made a. It was in like video production class. We made a music video. We had to like do a music video, and mine was just uh, like lip syncing to a Spice Girls song, but coming out of a dumpster. Wow, that's like a. Like- like a banana peel on my head. You did that. Yeah, because I just thought it would be That's funny. That's awesome. What and song? I, was, uh, I don't remember. Yeah. Block that part of my life out. Block it out. But it was just like, yeah, I was like, fuck the Spice Girls. But now looking back, they're they're cool. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I think they could have used a little of that uh, dumpster edge? vibe. Dumpsters, dumpster dumpster spice vibe. Uh, I can bring vibe. a dumpster vibe to anything. <laughs> <laughs> so let's run it back to where you grew up originally. In, in, um, in Vernon, BC, which is like interior BC. Uh, on the lookers left side of Canada. Love that lookers terminology. Lookers left. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Like and looking at a map. Yeah. yeah. I never heard that and I love it as well. I would think looking up at a backcountry line, lookers left or riders left, lookers left. Yeah. So. I think we think in those terms, right? Mm-hmm. So you grew up in Vernon and, and then at what age did you find snowboarding and get into that? Like old. I mean, compared to a lot of people. Uh, like I think I started when I was 14 and I didn't really like it. Because I, I started because I was skiing, and not that I even really liked that, but that's just what you did on the weekend where I'm from. And all my friends started snowboarding, and I got one that was, like, way too big for me and hated it because I couldn't turn, and the bindings would just fall off in the middle of a run. So, honestly, the first whole year, I was like, this sucks. I suck. I hate everyone's waiting for me. That's awesome. And then, did you have a point where it clicked, and you're like, oh, this is, this is what I want to do? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I've told the story a million times, but um, we rolled up to, I used to be in gymnastics and was like pretty hardcore into it. And we rolled up to this this jump that these guys were building like above the parking lot. And they were like, oh, this is for backflips only. Like, get out of here. And I was like, bitch, I can do a backflip. So I wrote, like pointed it. I couldn't even turn toe side, but pointed it to the jump, hocked a backflip, landed on my head and just tomahawked down into the parking lot. Respect. But yeah, the, the dudes were like, holy shit. And I was like, yo, that was easy. And I mean, I didn't know for a long time that you were supposed to land. Or that like, I mean, I, I made a snowboard video with my video part. And I don't I landed maybe like one thing. I thought it was about the huck. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if you want to look at my whole career, you can definitely tell it's about the, <laughs> about the huck. I think we should reframe the way videos are made. Yeah. And make it, you don't need to land. You don't need oh to my land. God. Just chuck just, roast. Yeah, huck. Imagine we could have a part of, like, all the stuff that we, like, the insane, I don't know if it's the same with you, but, like, I almost landed some crazy shit that mm-hmm. if, oh, man. Yeah, all the almost yeah. would be sick. Yeah, I think that's a great, I think we just bail on the lands all together. Yeah. <laughs> just go chuck frontside double as hard as you can off the lip and see what happens. You just got to flip until you hit the ground. Yeah, flip till you hit. There'd be a lot more pros out there, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, around this kind of trajectory of making your first video part and things like that, uh, I have a question from Mark Dangler that I found very interesting for the listeners that are unfamiliar. Dangler is the Capita, I don't know if it's C3 team manager, marketing manager maybe. Capita marketing manager, I think. Yeah, he's a he's a champion. We've always called him Daddy Dangler, and now he's actually a, a, a dad. He is a dad. So shout out to uh, Dangler and being a dad. 
Hey guys, stoked that you have Jess on the show today, so I wanted to call and drop a question. Jess, I think many would agree some of the reasons you have so many fans in your corner rooting for you in your career is that we can see how much hard work you've put in to make it and appreciate the humble position that you hold. And we've always admired your generosity to others. You've helped fuel dreams for many and kickstart several careers through your giving in the uninvited projects. Your success has meant the success for others and you are a champion for the underdogs. So I'm wondering if before you made it in snowboarding, you have one experience where a pro snowboarder you looked up to did something or gave something to you that locked you in on this snowboarding path for life and helped shape your view of never forgetting about the up and comers. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'd start with like the shallow one first. I saw Chris Duffesey at my, this is when the Forum 8 was hot. I saw Chris Duffesey at my hill and he, I was like, oh, can I have your autograph? And he's like, yeah, yeah. He's like going in his backpack to grab something to sign and he's like pulling out a Forum sticker and there was like $100 bills flying out of the backpack. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's what a pro <laughs> snowboarder gets. <laughs> Um, and then the other one would be from Marie Francois and, um, MFR for those who don't know. Um, and I, I think the reason that I try so hard to like to help people and give them a boost and stuff is because it took me so long and so much like getting shot down and having, feeling like I had no opportunities. But when I moved to Whistler, um, my friend Troy had made a snowboarding video and he like rented out this place to do the premiere and Whistler was like the where you move if you want to turn pro. Um, and Marie France was my favorite snowboard. It was her, her parts in any means, um, it, like her parts in the Rome videos, they were insane. And um, <laughs> do a shout out. Oh, big, yeah, of course. Major, major, major. major. Yeah. That shit changed my life. But, um, so there was this website called snowboard.com. Did you guys know about it? Oh, yeah. Okay, I yeah. didn't know if it was just a Canadian thing. No, yeah, that was like but a message board. But I would, yeah, I'd hit her up and be like, oh, my God, you're so cool. I love you. Like, I'm your biggest fan, you know. We have this premiere. Um, <laughs> we have this premiere for um, the snowboard video I'm in. And if you want to come, like, I'll leave a ticket for you at the ticket office. Like, <laughs> Ricky Bobby's dad. Um, <laughs> and I was Great like, reference. oh, she's, yeah. she's never going to come. But she showed up. She showed up. Not only did she show up, she came to my house party after and like fucked shit up and was spraying champagne everywhere and basically was the last person there. And I couldn't believe that she gave me the time of day, not just like a fake time of day, like, oh, hey, how's it going? Here's my um, autograph. It was like she came and watched and cared. And so my whole career I've based on that experience, like seriously, to, to show up and watch and give a shit. Damn, that is some inspirational. That's an, that's a fucking awesome story. Yeah, she took it to the next level. That's so cool. Yeah. And you you hadn't met her. You didn't know her. You just talked. I to just her on I, the just, I just had like harassed her on snowboard.com. Mm -hmm. And my name, my username for those who may have befriended me back then was Dumpster Spice. <laughs> wow, so. might have to hit that with a little air horn again. <laughs> so she's looking at this thing like Dumpster Spice is throwing an event. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> that's so legendary though it's like some some serious inspiration of of uh giving back and how that you know in and inversely like it's it's cool to hear you know there's stories of pros like that that have given you the time uh, that and that will just light a fire into your passion for snowboarding and inversely there's sometimes there's pros that are a dick that you meet and they're and they're the the opposite of that and it's just, it's, it's important to nurture how important like that phase in somebody's life is when they're, they're first catching the bug and getting addicted to snowboarding. And Yeah. Like I was way past the point where I could have made it. I, I think I was 23 when I moved to Whistler mm -hmm. and, um, just her like giving a shit seriously. Like I wonder honestly, if I would have kept going, cause I was really on the fence of just going back to school and moving back home. Um, I really wonder what my trajectory would have been if she hadn't if like my biggest like it wasn't just like a pro snowboarder that I liked it was the pro snowboarder that I wanted to be like I was riding roam boards I just wanted to be everything like her and that's what I've tried to do with the girls with the uninvited is just like show up and give a shit and not 
scroll through my phone while I'm filming them or whatever, you know, like take the time to, I don't know, just like it, people don't realize how much, um, just somebody believing in you for a second can like, yeah, lift you up and push you to the next level. And then also like, I appreciate all the experiences that I had where like people were dicks at the time. I didn't appreciate it, but it made me know what it felt like to be on the outside and to not be included and stuff. And so like, when you're if you're like treated like a the hero your whole career you know you're you never realize how what it feels like to be on the other side and I definitely know what it feels like to be on the other side so I also appreciate that side yeah that's a that's a great uh sense of perspective there too you a lot of times I think sometimes you see that with child prodigies or something that have been just in the limelight the whole time never never uh saw any other side of it and that's awesome the the people that I get later successes oftentimes are more humble you see a lot of times and things like that now before we get into the un- uninvited and all that stuff because I definitely want to dive in heavy but I kind of want to go back to when you first started filming with Think Tank and I know that you had been kind of grinding sharpening your teeth you had you kind of were building that fire and then you know shout out to Jesse Bertner and <laughs> Like, uh, I'm not sure. Sean Genovese. And Sean and Geno, yeah, big time major. Let's give Geno another one of those just because he's an absolute champion. But, um, you know, what I want to, what I'm fascinated with is the arc of a career in a sense that you're, you're, you want to make it, you want to have an opportunity, you want to get in these big videos. You've been filming local small videos and then you get asked to film for Think Tank and like your mentality going into filming that first video part. Yeah, so. When I got the email, like, it was total cold call. I got an email from Jesse Bertner, and I was like, this is spam from someone pretending to be Jesse Bertner. And he was like, yeah, we need another rider, capita rider, and um, would you want to come on this trip? And literally, I was like, cool story was playing on my, like, I had my stack of DVDs, and it was all, like, cue the birds, cool story, like, all the all the Think Tank videos were in a stack because I would just watch them over and over and over again because the kind of writing that they were doing and the stuff they were showing was like hectic and attainable for me and like looking outside the box because I knew that I couldn't go do the super crazy shit, you know. Um, but being like, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe it when I got that email and that was like thanks to Blue who gave me that opportunity. Like I pretty much grabbed Blue by the collar and was like, I want to film like this is you know I god I want I feel like my brain is going to explode right now because I just can remember just wanting it so bad and I was working construction at the time I had I was getting free snowboards and nothing else um and I had to work I remember up until like December 12th that year because yeah I was working construction it was a sick powder year I couldn't afford a season's pass all my friends were like texting me on my flip phone being like it's where are you it's so sick up here and um I was like pushing a wheelbarrow of concrete uphill in the snow I was like fuck so after work every I would go like I had a pvc stashed in the in the trees at the ice rink and I would just go after work and like under the street like just practice and practice and practice and practice like all my tricks so by the time I got off the plane to be in Alaska like I was so fired up I filmed that whole part in like two weeks really came out swinging probably your first trip was in anchorage yeah in anchorage yeah and that's where you you switched from board rincon and backtail the concrete ledge yeah yep and uh is it called rincon Rincon? not rincon oh warren's off yeah warren's off that's what i meant rincon's a skate spot that looks like that yeah that warren's off thing i was like i told them what i wanted to do on it and jenna was like okay and bertner was like uh we don't have that much gas left in the generator you know and then the generator did run out of gas so they had to go get more gas. And by then, it was the, I was the second person to hit it that night. And it was like 2 in the morning. And it's a bungee spot, too. Um, and they went to get gas. And I just sat there in the dark being like, just zoning in, being like, I ha- I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And they get back. And I think I got it. Like, every other try, there was, it was not even close. Mm-hmm. Not, and they were probably just like, OK. Like, they didn't know me. That was the second spot I had hit there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I did it and Bertner didn't even pan out because the camera, like the tripod was locked off. Cause mm. it was like, I mean, I never actually asked him about this, but 
it you can see like him unlocking and being like oh yeah Jess and then like panning out into the dark like that's how I was trying to do things that people would never believe I'd be able to land and I didn't really believe I would mm -hmm. be able to land but I was just gonna try mm -hmm. he the, didn't think you're gonna land that I, it's almost like the the drive is higher than the skill set but it, oh, oh that's my whole life yeah. that is my <laughs> whole life mm -hmm. it's beautiful though too because you look at you know a lot of times you know recognizing that this is the opportunity this is i don't want to say make or break but kind of like oh, it was oh, make or break it's and so like you're the one of those people that that's gotten that opportunity that's make or break and been like okay this is my time i need to put everything i have in my fucking loins into this that that fire that only a only a fucking eight or however you know young kid that's that's on the the beginning of a bell curve of a career has that deep of a burn and then just go all in you yeah. know i think i was 24 when i went on that trip too mm -hmm. so it was like dude it's it's happening now or it's not happening i actually thought it wasn't happening so i wanted to go out with like a big fuck you fuck you this is what i could have done bye mm -hmm. now i'm going Back to working construction, getting my masonry <laughs> ticket or whatever. Mm -hmm. How long did it take to land that back tail? I want to say it was less than 10 tries, I think. <laughs> but it so was like all the other tries were like clipped on the, just clipped on the takeoff close. and flip <laughs> over backwards. I th yeah, or like I would slide it, but then I'd like slide out and smash my face on the rail. I mean, that thing's high. I don't know if you've ever been there, that, but it's, tall, it's, yeah. it's taller than me. Yeah. And... uh it wasn't like a big snow year, so, and I'd never even tried that on a rail. Rail, the first one I tried was on on like a feature was on that ledge, mm -hmm. that's like kind of like a park box, mm -hmm. you know, the classic South Ledge or whatever. Yep. So, uh, Chris, I think it's time to pay some bills. I think so too. Now it's summertime. People like to throw back the icy cold crush can, if you will. Yes. Now, if you're going and you want to do. A good night of drinking, have a good time, a couple cold ones with your friends. I recommend getting yourself some pub beer. Yes, the price is right. They are cheap, fun beer. That's their motto. That's the motto. Hashtag cheap fun beer. So uh, they present a little section of the show called the breakout moment. Now, Jess, do you have a memorable breakout moment from your career? I mean, the filming that first thing, thank part for sure. Uh, I had all of those, their video part songs on my iPod. And I remember like eating shit really bad for that whole trip. So I was like, I was like tripping being like, I'm in the video game right now. This is fucked up. And I'd like f eat shit really bad. And like, you know, when people come over and take off your board because you knocked yourself out. And I'd be like, oh, trying to like turn down my iPods. <laughs> so <laughs> so no. they wouldn't hear that you were listening or, to their yeah. song. Or in the van, they'd be like, yo, you want to put on some tunes? I'm like, nope. No, uh, let's, I, my, that was, my iPad's broken. Yeah, my that was when broken. you only had, what, could have fit one playlist on your iPod shuffle. So. Yeah. And you, you would have, put, if they plugged it in, it would have been all their video Oh, parts. I would have started walking. <laughs> that home. would have been epic. That's incredible. Yeah, I think that's incredible. And who was the one to call you? Burtner himself? Burtner, yeah. He's a G. Such a boss. Such a boss. Another question we like to ask for pub beer is uh, who in your career has been the most fun to party with in the snowboard industry? Uh, crush. Crush. I like yeah. that. He's a good partier, professional partier. Yeah. I think when, uh, the, after I won my first awards, he like smashed his balls on them and like stamped the glass and then. Jenna, like, ripped off one of his pant legs completely, so he went out to the after party with just one pant leg. <laughs> that's good style. <laughs> that's a legendary move. Yeah, that's a legendary What's up with move. the, one of the ones you won, there was a giant dildo on the Yes, street. swinging Where around. Where did you get that thing Like from? a helicopter? I was so <laughs> nervous drunk that, because, uh, that, yeah, that was my first award show, um, <coughs> and I think, like, Ranquit was getting the um, Legend Award, so I won one award, they took me to the green room to do a thing, uh, interview, and I looked around, and I was like, what are all these dildos doing here? And so I just grabbed the big fatty and put it around my neck like a scarf. I heard you threw it into the crowd. I threw it into the crowd. Um, and, yeah, it landed on the forum table and spilled, like, <laughs> spilled their drinks into their laps and cameras. And everyone was like, who is this? This chick is so unprofessional. Or, wait, no. I was like, yeah, no shit. I work construction, bitch. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, people were like, that was really disrespectful. Your whole, I got a lot of, like, disrespectful shit after that. But Like from third-party people yeah. or from forum crew? No, I don't know. From third-party. Third-party. Because it's not like any oh, of those guys would talk to me. Yeah. We, need, we actually need more projectile dildos. rubber dildos flying through the air. 
at all costs. Like, I don't know if you know the one we're talking about. It's like. It's huge. It's the heaviest, probably like single sex toy that exists. It's the, double, double, the three foot long, ended, three foot long. I think for snowboarding's sake, like we we just that you could probably mount bindings on that, that thing that, and shred. Oh could, my! God. It would probably <laughs> come back part. Be like the original uh, skate banana. Yeah, you ever see those things? They're super soft. It's the skate penis. <laughs> It'd be like a snake board, the skateboard where you can go like <laughs> the snake board that they have. I might finally be able to do a good nose press on that thing. Hell yeah! Who knows? Uh, so the you know more than just like obviously this this part was super huge for you, but uh, I think it's cool to talk about you know what it meant for snowboarding as a whole, and I think just on the topic of maybe women's representation. Ugh. No. Yeah, I mean, yes, <laughs> but when it's brought up like that, like, I guess that's how it has to be brought up these yeah. days. But, um, and I respect that. Um, but I, there is this part of me that, like, feels uncomfortable about, and, and yeah, like, chicks and uh, the word women's representation, like, I feel like it's, and maybe this is just stuck in me, because I'm, I'm so used to being worried that, like, if we talk like that, the guys are going to be like, fuck off, like, you know? There's a part of me that like kind of recoils at that statement because it's like, no, 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 we're not like, we don't need anything special. We just need a, a chance, you know? I didn't realize what it meant at the time, but I could see like looking back, I could like, because I thought my part sucked, honestly. I had way bigger plans for what it was going to be. But when I think about how, like, I don't know, people don't get it. When I think about how it felt to watch, like, I used to watch. MFR's video parts and cry not because I was like sad but cry because I was like holy fuck I'm so inspired to see someone that they're letting they're letting her in they're letting her you know they brought her on the trips they're and that was when like before it was like women's representation we have to include them like that was before they had to do it back then they could just literally shit on our faces and laugh about it and actually, it's just in this moment right now that I'm thinking, like, I always knew, like, yeah, okay, it was a breakout part, but, like, I'm thinking, like, if that part in Think Tank meant what MFR's parts meant to me, like, to other girls, that's fucking nuts. That's nuts. That's and I, I know it did for a yeah. fact. I can confirm that. <laughs> for a lot of them. And for the fucking dudes out there that sucked or were losers mm -hmm. and, like, weren't in the crew, like, just to see someone... Who had such a small chance, try so hard and punch their way in. Like, I didn't, like, get asked to be in. I, like, bulldozed my way <laughs> in. It's a great analogy. Well, the, you, the way you explain it is so eloquent because I'll, I'll just be totally honest and, and be myself in the thought that, like, you know, you hear this, you need to include women. You guys aren't doing a good job. You're, you guys are blowing it. You need to, and, and like, you, as a dude, we hear these things and I'll be honest with you. Like sometimes I don't get it. Like I don't, it doesn't resonate in, in the sense and that's ignorance and, and just being honest. And, and like when you hear things or it, and I do get, I understand it, but the way you explain it is so eloquent that it makes me get it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, which is, it sucks to say that, that I, that we're like, Oh, j they can come. But like, yeah, I'm not like calling and inviting girls on trips and things. It's like, yeah, so I, I well, love I, the way I, you explain it. Yeah, I don't, and that's why when you said women's representation, I kind of like cringed. I was like, no, because if you present it like that, like you guys have to do it. What the fuck's wrong with you? Well, it, people aren't going to listen. And if you just sit there and talk about what you guys should be doing and what you're doing wrong, nobody's going to listen. But if you go out and film a video part that just fucks with every single opinion you've ever had about what girls are capable of, then people are going to listen. You need to make, and, and this has been my concept from the start, you need to make people listen with your actions and not by complaining. And I mean, there's a lot of people out there that'll probably, I know that like, it's a, we're in a different time right now. And when I went to, we did that uh, It's Tits event and we did an, a panel discussion and like hearing the questions that were coming in and like the, it was almost like, I'm probably going to get shit for saying this, but there was, like, this sense of entitlement in the new generation that's, like, you just have to include, include us because we are. And, uh, like, I don't want to be included because I am a girl. 
I want to be included because I'm pushing the boundaries of what we're capable of. And, and people say, oh, well, if you want equality, then you need to be as good as the guys. And I used to really think that. And that's why I, or that's, I, I didn't, that wasn't my opinion. It was more like the only way that anyone's going to listen or watch is if I'm trying to do the same shit as the guys are trying to do. But I want to explain something about why the girls aren't as good at stuff. Um, so your whole life, you're like, you know, given all these messages, even now, like people are like, oh my gosh, you're, 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 I can't watch your crashes. It's so hard to watch. And it's like, but they might, if they saw a guy doing the same thing, they might kind of laugh at it. You know, like you're just told like, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. Plus your like DNA is like, be careful, protect the child you're supposed to make, you know? So you're, you're, you, you're really kind of, um, trying to think of the right word. You're really kind of like held back by all this stuff because you don't believe that you can do it, but you, you know, you want to do it, but no, especially if you've not seen anyone do it, you have to, it's just, it's just different. And it's harder to make yourself like push past those things. All the guys out there like are expected to kill it at stuff. They're expected to be tough and strong and powerful. And, and it sucks for the dudes who aren't like, I can see that they probably feel like girls do a lot, but we're not, people aren't like, yeah, like they're like, yeah, when you do, once you've done it, but all of the like practice and skills and everything it took to get there, nobody was like, yeah, they were like, uh, whatever, go do your cute little thing, you know? But yeah, I, I, the, the whole, like, yeah, of course girls should be included. People should be included, but like, don't forget to get to, to be good at what you're doing. I, uh, on this message or on, on this topic of what you said earlier, um, I Googled the definition of tokenism and <clears throat> it's the practice of making a symbolic effort to do a particular thing, especially by recruiting a small number of people from underrepresented groups in order to give the appearance of sexual or racial equality within a workforce. And, uh, I thought that that, cause I was just curious as like somebody, somebody brought it up. I think that, uh, Jules who works for us. Shout out, I'm going to give her an air horn. She's awesome. She brought up tokenism, and I didn't know what it meant. And um, and so, like, it it's something that, that like, I, I find a problem with brands. I've mentioned it before. I don't want to sound like I'm beating a dead horse, but I, I hate when people put any type of person on a brand just to check the box. It's like, oh, we, we need more women. Check the box. Uh, just, like, just get somebody, whoever it is. Boom. It's like, no, put put her on because you believe in her and you back her not because you're scared of getting canceled which i see sometimes and it's like and so like let's actually do it because we care not so for fear of social lashing out you know that's my take on it in some senses yeah i'm glad that you read me the definition of tokenism because i got a lot of those questions when we were doing the panel and like how do you feel about tokenism how would you address it with the companies how would you confront the companies who are doing who are doing tokenism whatever yes. um and i was like huh like if someone wants like it, it, there always has to be a first and you could say tokenism man i'm just gonna get fucking slaughtered for all just this be honest okay Who gives a shit um what about the companies like um that put uh the first snowboarders on because they wanted to uh like back back way 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 back in the day <sighs> that were like oh we're gonna sponsor snowboarders because they wanted to please a certain demographic and they wanted a piece of the of that market. I don't think those guys were complaining with their unlimited credit cards and all that shit. And now it's like, dude, I don't care how I get in. I don't care if I get in because I'm a fucking groundhog. Like, just let me in. Give me a chance. And yeah, there is always going to be people that are put on programs that maybe because of their skills shouldn't be there, but it's creating a spot and then someone like, these girls that are in the uninvited are going to get ha going to have an opening. Even if like the first round, just don't like judge the first round of things mm -hmm. and don't like, if someone wants to give someone like you an opportunity, you're going to complain about it. Mm -hmm. I get it. Like I get that sometimes it seems insincere and cheesy, but like who gives a fuck? It's a good point. That's a great point. Who gives a fuck? Like just give them an opportunity. Yeah, let us point. in. Yeah. I don't care how I get in. That's a great point. I love that. It's what you do with it. Mm -hmm. It's not like just the fact that you have it. Yeah. One, and one other thing I want to get, I want to pick your brain on something that I notice. And I, so I'm friends with a bunch of team managers. Uh, like just, we know a bunch of people in snowboarding, right? There's discussions. And, um, and I want to preface this with, this is meant to be like motivational. It's not meant to, it's, it's meant to be, and, and hopefully it's not taken the wrong way. But I noticed that like a lot of 
teams, they're like, we need to put on more women, right? We need to put them on. Like, we're trying to sign a woman. We're just not sure who. We're trying to sign a woman. We're just not sure who. That's a, that's a common theme I hear. And I, I feel like there's, there's like kind of an upper tier an, of women who are, are just like clearly kind of just have really dominated uh, in their respective genres. Right. And then there, there's a, there's a large portion of incredible, incredible women snowboarders, but they haven't leveled up into that, that next category. And I feel like, I feel like, uh, and I don't know if this is to be taken wrong. You can correct me or tell me if I'm out of line with this too. I'm just totally being open with this, but I feel like that, that just like the way that you leveled up and MFR leveled up and Desiree and there's, there's like, you know, the list goes on, but, um, like that level up is, is, uh, like, it's like, I feel like this is what I'm trying to say is that women, some women are so, so close to the level up. They just need a little more of a nudge. And I'm like, they're, they're closer than they think to getting the, the bigger deal. You know what I mean? What do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, I think that, there's something missing with like it that I think it's just in like the past two years I feel like companies are like because I've been dealing with these companies not with my own sponsors but by doing these uninvited videos for I guess the past five years and trying to advocate to the girls to the sponsors and like talking to those team managers and Mm -hmm. having them be like oh we really want to do something but there's literally nothing we can do for these girls Mm -hmm. like I'm like can you send them an extra board so they can sell it like Mm -hmm. this this could be the next thing and now they want someone at the top but there nobody has done anything to create put any resources in at the bottom like there is with dudes there's like dude ams there really isn't chick ams maybe like now a, f- a couple yeah in the past couple of years but it takes a couple of years to develop the amount of skills that like that's an understatement like the amount of skills that jill perkins has you know it takes a couple of years um so i think that it's important if they, I think the companies that are going to win at this game about and the, the ones that are able to like get and retain the best chick riders out there, they need to like put some effort into developing the ones that they can see like have the work ethic, have the potential, have the drive, and give them some resources and take them out filming. And like a lot of the girls haven't like that are sick, like haven't even really been filmed. They don't even know what they look like. So like, yeah, if they suck, like they may not know it yet. <laughs> they need to improve. They may not know it yet. And um, I'm not saying that, like, I know there's a ton of guys out there struggling, too, that are, aren't ams and whatever, but there is there is this, like, arc for the dudes. Mm-hmm. And for the girls, they, they all of a sudden want the, the best pro rider or the best, the sickest rider out there. But um, the reason that there's a short, there's a reason that there's a shortage. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. Yeah, they need to invest in them while they're <laughs> young and get them on a crew, get them out with people, because then you do get to that next level advancement. And also make them feel like there's something to shoot for because really there's two levels. There's nothing and then there's super pro. And so the girls that are coming up that are like, shit, I'm like breaking myself every year. I'm spending all my money. I'm working full time in the summer just to spend it all in the winter to get by. Like, is there any, if that pro position like is so unattainable, but if there's something in the middle being like, oh, well, I heard so-and-so actually got like a $3,000 budget this year. Mm -hmm. Um, that that would tide me over for the winter. I could live on that and film a part and or a small travel budget. Like there isn't that thing to shoot for. So I think a lot of girls that have the potential quit. And I've seen girls like Jesse Higgy or like Corinne Pasela, like the sickest. They could have changed everything, but the industry wasn't there to see that. That was at a time they didn't even want the the, the pro, the top girls. <laughs> That's honestly, that's such a great sense of perspective. That's like, I, that was such an eloquent answer. I I love that. And, and light bulbs going off for idiot dudes Mm -hmm. (laughs) that that (laughs) need to hear that, honestly, because we, we need to like, you know, understand things. And, and, um, so I love when it's explained in such a great way, like, oh yeah, idiot, they they didn't invest in the team, them as AMs for them to, you know, the farm, the farm team for them to get graduate into the, from the minors into the pros, you know, that's what the uninvited is. It's Mm -hmm. a, fucking farm <laughs> the farm team yeah. yeah brands get their one big pro and then they're like all right we're set we got our women Let's yeah and go. then two years later they're like oh oh we need a new one what do we do yeah yeah that's perfect uh well on the subject we got a question from one of the uninvited members here we Uh-oh. go hi jess it's your dear friend Derry <sighs> mclean uh you've done so much for me within my snowboarding as well as every other 
aspect of my life. Um, and I've watched you support and encourage and really propel many women's snowboard careers. So my question for you is what compels you to do so much for other people? Um, what motivates you to do things like spend your own money and your time and your sanity so that other girls can film video parts? I just can't really wrap my mind around that. I think you're the most selfless person I know, so I'd just love to know where that comes from. Um, I could honestly go on and on about how many kind things you've done for me and how much you mean to me and how great you are, but I'll leave it at that. Love you. Uh, Bombhole, I'm a big fan. I can't wait to hear this episode. Thanks. Oh, shout out Dara. Yeah, that was nice. He's a big old ear horse. Wish she'd say that stuff to me in real life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> um, what motivates me to do that stuff is because I remember, I remember what it was like. <coughs> there were so many things like when I got came into it that fucking sucked. <laughs> And so many experiences that were, like, brutal that almost broke me. And I just want to help people, you know, like, this whole pro snowboarding thing, it feels really selfish. And there's a point, like, on the upswing, you're like, cool. But then there's a point where you're like, what is this for? This is, like, this is fucked up. This is all ego. This is whatever. And, I mean, it's probably selfish in a way, too, to, like, try to help all these people because I want to feel like my life has meaning. And especially after like certain really big things that have happened in my life that kind of re reframe my perspective on like, what are we doing while we're here? And also like, there's this huge, huge, like, I, I hate using like cliche terms, but like this imposter syndrome where I've always been like, like, I never thought, I, I never even knew that you could really make a uh, career off snowboarding I just wanted to film one video part that would like bitch slap people in the face that was my goal and I didn't realize you could like make money off it and have a living and I guess like I'm so connected to those girls that are have these dreams because I like I mean not even like officially through the uninvited stuff like I'm always like hitting them up on Instagram or like watching what they're doing and um trying to encourage them and and I can see that they're struggling and I can see like how like how just a little bit of encouragement could push them to the next level and like I care about girls snowboarding um I really care and I want to see it go as far as it can go like even if it's at the expense of my own career um and so I also just want to share what I have like I from the first snowboard that I got uh, for the first sticker pack I got I'd split it in half and give the other half to my friends you know like I don't know it just makes it you're getting something and then you're like spreading it not to be a nice person but just like it makes you feel like you've gotten more because all your bros and your friends <laughs> are benefiting from it too in a way you know we're like are stoked and yeah you're bringing everyone along for the ride it's yeah it's incredible and then if you look at like just just for people that aren't familiar like i've, I've been told that you've spent over twenty five thousand dollars of your own travel budget and budget on helping these women and, and things like that is that correct i mean i've never added it up but yeah at least that <laughs> yeah. yeah probably more by now huh? and that's just powerful because it you know it's not what you're describing is not something taught to North Americans as a culture, you know, or most, I don't know if any cultures teach that, but it's, it's just really powerful to understand, you know, and, and uh, yeah, like what's the point of money if you have nobody to share it with, you know, we've, we've mentioned that on the show and that's, that's kind of a shitty corny cliche analogy, but in regards to all that stuff, you know, it's a, it's a powerful message and, and uh, yeah, like going, I mean, diving into a little bit of a wormhole that's kind of heavy as well, but too, like, you know, I, when you, when you lose somebody close to your perspective of what matters shifts too. And that like, kind of, when you think about all from, from an aerial view, from looking at it from 3000 feet and not just this daily grind of horse blinders of day to day, you realize like in the big picture, what's important. And I think that that's like, you know, that to me also seems not to put words in your mouth where that stems from too, right? And you, you did mention that, so. Yeah, I mean, 
it's all going to end. Yeah. And there's going to be a point where we're going to ask ourselves, like, what did I, what did I do with my life besides doing stuff for myself? Because I definitely have reframed my, my priorities and, and, but I mean, like even before that shit happened, I always had that mentality because I think I, I came from like, I, I was like, always felt like I was the underdog and I wanted to be like the people's champ and I felt like I was like gunning for all the people who couldn't make it or who didn't like all the dudes I knew at my local hill who like had the talent but never got a chance you know um the people's champ the people's people's champ champ. I like that but yeah I lost track of my thoughts well like you said you were talking about as you uh as you mature and you go through different experiences and you you just live life you start to realize like what am I doing? What am I going to leave behind? What's my mark? And I went through that at once. Like, you know, people have these big, serious jobs where they're doctors or they're changing the world. And here we are out just traveling around, having Getting fun. Getting kicked out of streets. <laughs> shooting each other. And you eventually start to think like, oh, what, what is this? And yeah. finally through this podcast, I think Chris and I are able to experience a different side of affecting people and talking about on deeper subjects and and that's rad. So I understand, like, you're taking a different approach. Sense of purpose. Yeah. Sense of and, totally. And you're able to maybe elevate all of women's snowboarding. And that's awesome. So it's, I think the life experiences have led you to that. And it's it's an awesome thing. And it's cool to see that you're doing that. I've always had this kind of, like, Robin Hood mentality, too, that I thought was, I always thought it was such a sick concept. <laughs> Not that, I hope Too many of my sponsors aren't listening, but, like, the whole... Well, (laughs) fuck it. They're all listening. Fuck it. I used to ride for Nike, okay? And I was like, are you serious? These trips that we'd be on, the dinners they take us to, and it was like, you know, the whole Robin Hood, like, steal from the rich and give to the poor. And I see see that that gap for the girls that there is money at the top, but there's nothing below it. So I was essentially trying to, like, fill that in as in I told you so, because it was like, if you just give these girls, like, the tiniest thing, like, let them sleep in your hotel room, give them a seat in your rental van... Uh, you let your filmer film them and all of a sudden they are the next big thing and it's kind of like yeah fucking told you guys like why didn't you help them out and not that I would ever I I was like hiding for a long time that I was even doing that because I just wanted the impression like you know like fake it till you make it kind of thing the impression to be that um, there were girls just coming up so the guy the companies better put them Mm -hmm. on you know, give them some resources. You were sneaking them in the side door. Sneaking them in the side door. <laughs> What's funny is one Nike dinner at a trade show oh could fund a whole Dude, it was, fleet of women. It was killing me. It was yeah. killing me. You see those like 80K bills and some yeah. of these trade show rep dinners. Or... Well, Facts. also, I, I got to commend you on the fact that it's fucking working. Like if you literally just go through, you know, I know it's probably hard to be the, the farm team where you bring them up and then they move on. But like that's. That's you, okay. That's, like like uh, Ilfa, for example. I got to give her an air horn. I'm a huge, Dude. huge fan, humongous fan. But like, she, I got a Burton deal, and you know she's Maria killing Thompson. it. Maria Thompson, Kennedy. Yeah, Kennedy. Let's give Ken- all those air horn, big old air horns. But it's like what you're doing is you're you're basically like, all right, this shit doesn't exist. I'm creating my own fucking system to bring women up, and fuck you guys. And like now, I- explaining it in that manner is is great. Now. Hopefully, people listening to this are going to be like, "Oh yeah, shit, we need to, we need to fucking step our shit up here," you know? Maybe, or maybe they'll and be like, "Oh, I'm so sick of hearing about." No, this is a totally shit. different context. No, I think this you're is putting a it in context. a different light. You're like showing, shining a different light on it as like, "Oh, every woman needs X amount of budget to go." You're like actually wow. showing. Here's the showing the issue. You're explaining it in a thanks, good, guys. You're explaining it in a good way because I'll tell yeah, you this. that was that's been my goal since I was born. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Just right out the womb. As a man, I, I like to, we are kind of idiot Neanderthals, okay? Like, we're just like, that's why, I, this is my theory. I have no science behind this. But the reason why it's like, it seems, appears to be easier for us to, to like, backlip a kink rail is because I can just go, like, hollow head and just be like, I'm going to try this. I don't give a shit if I fucking tomahawk down the stairs. Like, I can just, like, it's just uh, idiot, like, fucking idiot Neanderthal, you know? Like, <laughs> And I think it's, which is great for doing tricks, but sometimes as dudes, you know, we're idiot Neanderthals in like not understanding things. And so. Well, yeah, wow. You just brought, made me think of something. It's like for all the straight guys out there, have you ever had a girlfriend? Have you ever had an argument with your girlfriend? Mm-hmm. It's like all of these swirling thoughts 
and you're just like, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's so true. So it's like everything is so much, and I mean, maybe that's not it for everyone, but like the communication, like the amount of like words and thoughts and, and, and like small inferences and um, this intuition and like all the stuff that you take, like, you know, you might leave somewhere after you get coffee and your girlfriend's like, ah, that chick was a bitch. <laughs> you're like, you're like, what? And like, yeah, and you see how she was meh. And yeah. you're just like, and you didn't huh? notice, yeah. And the only yeah. thing going through oblivious. my head is just like, I'm hungry. Yeah, yeah totally. You so know? I'm hungry and I want to fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Like when you're standing on the dropping ramp, you're like, oh my god, uh, what if I break my leg and then I can't work next year? Like, I mean, everyone thinks that stuff, but like, it, there's all this other stuff too. Like, do these people even want me to be here? I bet they don't want me to be here. They just looked at me funny. They didn't hand me the shovel, right? Like, not to say that that's what we're thinking about, but it's a lot more and mm-hmm. and i mean i guess for like i feel like the people who have the hardest time with um understanding this stuff is probably straight dudes so just think about like those arguments yeah. you had with your girlfriend that you're like yeah. what you're so oblivious that's, that's what we're <laughs> dealing with to try to punch through that and yes. back with a kink rail yes exactly so. it's a great topic and then also i want to rewind to something you said earlier and going back i feel as though like you know it's changing in the sense that women were grew grew up Men played with like toy trucks and women played with Barbies and, and you kitchen know, sets and kitchen sets. And like my sister, for example, doesn't let her kids play with, bar- she's got two girls. She doesn't let the girls play with Barbies. She's like, you be whoever you want to be. And, and so w- the way I, I describe that or see that is like, you know, there's, there's masculine and feminine traits in both men and women. Now, some men grow up and they want to play with the Barbies from a young age. And that's, Fuck it, let's go do that like play with the bar you don't need to play with the trucks and in the same sense is like women want to play with the trucks or whatever like what but what we're describing in a lot of this stuff is masculinity and femininity and masculinity and femininity doesn't have to do with what uh s- sex you are it doesn't have it's it's a choice of whatever you know you're called to and so like blurring those lines it, it's like it's it's okay to you don't have to fall into this any type of box and and that's like op- hopefully opens up women's light bulbs as a not as a small like as a full population to be like oh snowboarding is not like a boy sport I can go do that so it opens it up to the masses yeah you know what I used to have a big problem not a problem okay yeah big problem with the super girly chicks that were like skateboarding in a thong or like I don't know even the ones in snowboarding that had this like super sparkly like everything is unicorns Mm kind of image and I was like oh like fuck if you keep doing that no one's gonna take us seriously you know but um my roommate Ben at Bullock who like always has the fucking always has to (laughs) he's a contrarian he's not afraid to tell you the opposite only a contrarian yeah um even if you agree what he just agreed with he's gonna (laughs) he's gonna go the other way but he was like yeah think about all the girls that were look at you and you're like fucking rake yawn (laughs) you're not gonna get a lot of those girls are just not even going to approach snowboarding. They're not going to, um, they're not even going to want to get involved because they don't see themselves at all because you are so far, like you and Desiree and whoever like are so far on the other side of, of the dirt bag line. Mm-hmm. Um, but those girls who are all sparkly and whatever, like could get like other girls out there can see themselves in that. And, um, would start snowboarding or skateboarding because of it. And even though like still it's hard for me to watch some of that stuff. Cause I hate when how shit is like focused on how you look. It sucks. It sucks. Um, if you're not like facially gifted as others or butt gifted, whatever. <laughs> um, but butt. yeah, I think there's, Booty there's a room for everyone. <laughs> butt gifted is a great term. By the way. Oh, she's, that's, a, that's an ass gifted. She is butt gifted. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> No, but also that it really, I think it really, it, it's so good because it brings so many more women in. Yeah, we right? need them too. And, well, okay, we hold on. Let's cut the woman thing and just go to the snowboard thing. Uh, it's the same with guys. Like, yeah. You guys have probably seen dudes that just bug you to fucking, like contest guys or not, not in general, but like just certain riders that you're like, oh, this guy is ugh, like fucking cringe. But that guy might get. Like, we need all kinds of the guys. We can't just... Here's the deal. Here's the deal. I love making fun of all different types of genres of snowboarding. 
I love it. Me like too. you're just like, oh my god, look at this granola blader fucking yeah. fitness guy. Like or it's like mountain elitist. But it's like at the end of the day, we need them all. I understand. Like it's okay to to poke a little jab, and but also understand like that guy makes us like almost look better. That like you need the yin with the yang. You need totally. the, you need the guy that just wants to go get a wacky board and carve so we can make fun of him and backlip the rail, you know, and vice versa. He's like, that guy can't even fucking turn. I'm like, well, hit a jump, you know, but well, if we want budgets, we need them all up there. That's yeah. the other yeah. thing. Like the people, more the barrier. yeah. And everyone's like, Oh, the snowboard industry, but people are just skiing now or whatever. It's like, you guys want to make a living at this. There needs to be money in the industry, and that's, oh, that is something that so many people don't see the like the fact that this is a business. Mm-hmm. Not your writing is not a business, but I don't know that that like oh, that sense of entitlement of like oh it should be should be this or should be that. It's like have you ever asked yourself why? Mm-hmm. Like have, also, have you ever thought about the fact that if everybody snowboarded exactly like you? did you'd hate him you'd be the mainstream you true if everybody was front boarding the rail i'd be like i'm a turn guy i know yeah. for a fact because i'm a fucking <laughs> oh you want me to do this thing i'm gonna yeah, you're gonna opposite. do something different you start ski touring or something yeah exactly like that would be sick like every touring guy comes to the park starts jibbing and they're like fuck this man i'm touring now <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean we all started snowboarding to kind of stray away from what the masses were doing okay i think it's time for a little you know what <laughs> Name that video part. Okay, name that video part is unofficially sponsored by a local restaurant here in Salt Lake City that supports snowboarders, and it's owned by snowboarders, and it's called Spidelli's. We like to uh, promote local small snowboard businesses intermittently here on the podcast, pro bono. And uh, Spidelli's, it's got, uh, what, the Merrill... Manza, he's got his own pizza. Harrison Gordon's got a pizza. I got the Grendy's gold medal pie. Pat Moore's got a signature dish. Uh, and the the owners, two brothers, Mac and Sam Spadell, they are avid snowboarders. So if you are in Salt Lake City and want to support a cool pizza shop, go to Spadelli's. And if you mention that you came because of the bomb hole, they'll give you 15% off. So let's get into uh, name that video part. How are we feeling, Jess? Confidence level zero through 10. What do you got for us? Um, fake it till you make it. Eleven. Wow. Woo! No, Love I'm just that. Joking. Highest, but, highest we've got. Oh wait, confidence level on name that video part. Yeah. I thought you just meant in life. <laughs> <laughs> um, my confidence level on name that video part dropped significantly. Okay. Um, we need a number. Fuck. I don't know what. I don't know what uh, era you're going for, but let's just go three. Three is a solid, solid number. Get a lot of threes. <laughs> the eleven. That was. I was stoked. Yeah, we thought you were coming out swinging. But I actually no, like that. That's in, in life. That's that's tight. Okay, here we go. Chicken, 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 chicken. Okay, eleven. Okay, what is it? Oh, it's um Desiree and Laura's part in the first video grass video. Absolutely correct. Winner, winner. That is, yeah, congrats. I also feel like that's almost, if you didn't get that, that was uh, people would be bummed. I mean, you've thrown some meatballs out. That's a meatball sub. You know that that, is a, that's a so, meatball so, pizza from Spadelli's. Yeah, exactly. 15% I off. I think also the term meatball. meatball, I believe, from what I understand, I've always thought it as like when, when they throw a baseball and it, the pitch is just, it's a it's an easy one to hit. Because it's, it's like a, a meatball. big, big meatball. So I think under, some people don't understand the meatball reference I've read in the comments. Oh, really? Before. Yeah, I've heard that before. So it's like, oh, like, life. dude, you're gonna go yard with that thing because it's a meatball. So yeah. like, it's like a, you lobbed a meatball at him, and then they fucking hit it over. And the anyone wall. can slam a meatball with a bat, exactly. I'd imagine. Especially if it's a big Italian yeah. meatball. We should maybe add that to the spinning wheel of death. Uh, hit, a hit a meatball. Hit a bat. meatball. Yeah. All right. I wish you guys were playing it up like that was really hard. Good job, <laughs> eleven. Hey, guess what you get? I almost forgot to get. Oh yeah. Uh, we got a bomb a hole igloo cooler that is filled with bomb hole merch. We got a, I believe we got a coffee mug. What else is in there? Wait, Shirt. I get this? This, or is the, yours. this is yours. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's yours. That's Pete, your. That's a very sought after cooler too. People are like, you should sell those, but you got you only yeah, way we you don't, get it is we won't on sell the show. them. Yeah, it's so, a very special item. Um, you can oh. put that next to all your Trans World Rider Pole Awards. Yeah, uh, Women's Rider it means of the year. just as much. I would put it just above that in the trophy shelf because it's yeah. actually more important. An, you have an X Games gold medal. This goes above that. I'll for put sure. the all the trophies inside it. <laughs> yeah, put the trophies inside that. <laughs> that's a great idea. Keep them cold. Keep them room temp. 
Uh, okay, part two. This is for the listeners, viewers. If you're unfamiliar with how it works, when if you know what video this song is from, then you comment on Jess's picture on Instagram when her episode comes out, the first photo of Jess, and we that's how we pick our winner. And basically, uh, you get a prize pack, and we're on it now. So we haven't been missing prize packs. If you're the first one, you will win. Here we go. Coming at you. Lost my wizards. Keep the game on those digits and keep that butter on that biscuit. Okay. Thank you guys for playing. Name that video. Now, um, before we have so much shit to talk about. Well, one thing I think is cool is you kind of got some, some, you know, you, you were riding for Capita and C3 for a long time and shout out to time. those guys the whole time. But then you st- kind of got some bigger deals. You got on Monster and you got on Nike, which are some definite uh, biscuit winners in the- These uh, are the guys you want back in you. And, and so how did those, I was just curious, like, how did those deals come about? It's funny. It's it all comes from riding for Capita, because Blue was backing me, and I just like caught her. I caught a ride. So I never know when you're gonna <laughs> press a button. Sorry, I was looking for the air horn button for Blue. Keep it um, going. I knew it. I knew it. Um, and Blue was like Blue's two best friends are Bobby Meeks and Cody Dresser, and um, I, <laughs> um. I was I like caught a ride down from Whistler with Blue on his way to the airport and Cody Dresser was in the car and I like whipped out my iPod touch and was like or Blue was like show me pictures show me pictures because I had so many snowboard photos and I had them on hand at all times because I was like if I, <laughs> if I ever need to get an opportunity um, I gotta I gotta have them here true professional um, so I'd be like yo check these out and he was like damn you got a lot there was like 30 or something like pretty good ones um and uh, he talked to Evan, I think, and then Evan put me on, which was... Evan Lefebvre. Which was, yeah, shout out. So many horns. That was really sick. And then and then Bobby, like, I was riding for a different um, company, and I had been riding for them for a long time and was kind of not really feeling the love from the team manager there. Or I felt like, you know, whenever I had seen him, he was like, oh, Ben's girlfriend, <laughs> you know? Um, or yeah, it just wasn't really happening. So I was at a construction job. I remember Bobby called and I was like, cause I was like, dude, anything, give me anything, give me anything, like spit in my face and I'll take the switch. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good, uh, like an agent, like it's good negotiations there. Yeah. yeah. Spit my face and I'll take it. I'll do it. I'll sign. <laughs> spit on me. Um, and he, he's like, what do you need? And I like came up with the most basic, the, <laughs> Sorry. That's Just think about this negotiation tactic. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, continue. Um, I thought of like the most basic amount, you know, that would make sense that that I was like really hoping this other company might give me. Um because the part had just come out and I won all the awards and but I had no idea still of my own value or anything. And he hit, he called me back and was like, I'm sorry, we just can't do it. Like we want it to do it, but like everything spent for the year. It was like the wrong time in the budget season. And I was like, oh, okay. I used to it, used to getting shot down. Um, And then a couple weeks later, he called me back and was like, hey, we actually found it. So, like, I initially switched to Nike for an amount that wouldn't even, literally, like, I can't. (laughs) <laughs> for uh, let's uh, talk biscuits. Yeah, let's just biscuits. talk biscuits. Come on, you don't ride for them anymore, so you can talk yeah, about true. it. Yeah, true. So, it, I mean, uh, now I feel bad saying this. Now that we're going to state amounts, because there's a lot of people out there who would suck dick for this. But you just won Women's Rider of the Year, right? Or Women's Video Part? Which one was it? Video Part and Reader's Choice. So you just, just mind you, you were very accomplished already in the sense with this number. So. Yeah. Preface it with Those that. Those awards are a big deal. It's a, like you're basically number best video part of every woman on the planet. So I was looking for a thousand bucks a month. Very. So 12 yeah. grand. And um, he called me back like after, after being like, we can't do it. And I was like, yeah, obviously no one can do that. You know, um, I think that was what someone told me to ask for. And he called me back and was like, yeah oh, we, we can do it. And I was like, what? Yes. So then I switched like my first year with Nike. 
was uh, was for that. And then the next contract was significantly more than that. Booyah. Love that. I mean, Nike's got deep pockets. Yeah. yeah and you, sure. you, and that's good to know that you learned your worth. And you start to get, you got to, you got valued for what you were worth. You know, it sounds like with the Nike deal. Yeah, totally. I mean, it was crazy to make any money from snowboarding. Like literally at that time I was, I remember we were pouring a pool deck because I used to <laughs> do masonry um, when Bobby called. So I was like, any amount of money was the sickest amount of money. To get me out of doing this. Yeah. And uh, so uh, let me snowboard. In your own words, spit in my face and I'll take it. Spit in my spit face, in my face but also slide me a check for a thousand <laughs> yeah. a month. And I will take it. Honestly, a thousand a month was yeah, huge. Yeah, leave that construction site that day. Yeah. With a bundle of cash. So Absolutely. I heard a little uh, statistic that you are the most decorated trans world uh, pole person of all time. I mean, I, I'm not sure. Like, call in to the show if you have more awards, but I think I have 11 <laughs> call trans in. world. Someone's going to call in. I have 12. Well, no, because <laughs> they're always like, I, I've gone to all the, you the award shows. You won men's awards too, right? I was up for some men's awards. Up for. Um, rookie of the year. Rookie of the year, standout performance of the year twice. Um, and Two women's rider of the year. Three women's video part of the year. Five women's reader choice awards. Reader's choice is the big one, I think, because that's the from the people. And that's five. People's champ, told you. You're the people's champ. We're going to just call Not her the, the pros champ. 17 hey. rider of the year, snowboarder. Buds, we're going to call her the people's champ for the rest of she the She is the people's champ. We're just, she's not Jess, she's the people's champ. Try to get it to stick. But, okay, so I'd be at the award shows. Not that I care. Like, I honestly didn't. I thought these were automatic. If you filmed a girl's video part, you were going to get them. Because it, the first few years was just like sweep, sweep, sweep. And I didn't think I deserved them. I just got them. So now, looking back, not winning awards right now <laughs> it's kind of crazy to to think like how but i just didn't understand it yet but they would always be like oh yeah welcome the most decorated uh writer of all time danny cass with eight awards or nicholas Mueller with eight awards or whatever and I'd always be like bitch See? i got 12 <laughs> well no i'd be like i'd be like i knew i that you're just so used to like people don't care about the girls they don't care i mean That's now sad. they do okay but um no one would ever like go think like, oh, maybe it's a girl who has the most. Or and if they did, they'd be like, oh, well, of course it's easy for you. You guys just have to do a front board and. Well, you're you putting. Yeah, I don't know. That's I wouldn't put per words in people's mouths per se because I don't. Think okay, sorry, happens. not today, but then. Yeah. yeah. Like okay, let me let me give you this perspective. I know that sounds bitter, and I've been like, don't sound bitter, but. <laughs> Note to self. Don't. Okay. Okay, the people's champ. Continue. Uh, the, you know, like something like that, like like nobody's ever. Yeah, I don't care about the awards, really, but it's it's kind of annoying when you're like, whoa, people completely disregarded how many I've gotten. But also, like, name that video part, the chicken head part. Shout out Justin Meyer, first of all. Let's start with that. Let's start high and, and end low. Yeah, let's, let's cut, <laughs> start, cut and cut him down. Let's cut him down. Um, not even him, okay? But, like, I was so excited. Like, the, I needed that so bad to, to because there hadn't been anything since since Mofo's parts. And by then, she was like, eh, I'm going to go ride powder. Um, that Marie part France came out. Lot, Mofo, I love that. Oh, yeah. Everyone calls her Mofo, I mean, in Canada. I didn't yep. know that. Okay, yeah. I love it. So, um, I think, like, her dad probably calls her Mofo, even. Um, so, chicken head part. Chicken head part. I was so excited for that part to come out i was at the premiere and i had my camera set up on a tripod like my little point and shoot to record it so that i could play it and have it in my pocket at all times and it came on and it was like a joke like these girls were my heroes and it and it was a joke so like that tells us we're a fucking joke sorry but the 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 chicken head, the way it was edited. Well, the the part was edited like with kind of to be like lighthearted and funny, I think, but also also not knowing the Im the impact yeah, that that would have. have. But that that like the the lighthearted the the funny thing was always like make fun of the girls as much as like you guys probably didn't notice it for sure. And I'm not like oh they shouldn't have done that. It's just like that was it. You're yeah, like, that's a good point. They list point. a girl in the videos. I remember when Cheryl Mass was on the all the marketing for Forum that. 
And I was like, oh my God, far on that. Went to the fucking premiere. Same with um, Escrambol or whatever, that Vulcan video. Mm -hmm. First one in line at the premiere. Can't wait. Like the whole, and that one didn't have titles. So the whole time I'm like, was that shrill? Was that shrill? Was that shrill? And they're never in the video. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's kind of like, bitch, don't even try, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Uh, no, that's, that's super powerful. And that, at that point, yeah, it is like, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to play devil's advocate here a little Do bit it. in the fact that Justin Meyer makes fun of everybody with his editing. For sure. No, no, no. That so, wasn't, dude, like, I fucking like, um, love Darth, Justin. But I, Darth I just, Meyer. Just to, yeah. Just to like, to down, not to like devalidate what you said. Cause what you said is very. Oh, it wasn't, val it wasn't Justin Meyer. Yeah. It was just snowboarding as a whole. That was yeah. kind of like what you did. I mean, that was the same year that Dara was on Tosh.0. Oh. Yeah. And. Dara's never gotten a fair chance and she's really fucking good, mm -hmm. but she's been, and I mean, that's been pushed into her mind too. Like you're a fucking joke. You're literally a joke. You're a meme, you know, but uh, I'm not saying that that's what I just want to like give the, uh, like, I, I don't care. And I, I mean, I'm the first one to make fun of us, you know, but I just want to like give that other perspective of like all those things, like all your experiences add up. True. And if all of them are like, you don't really count. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I'm deeply scarred. Spit in my face. No, it's <laughs> <I'll take it. laughs> such a it's such a valid point. It's, no, it is it, a valid point. Yeah. But yo, fucking Justin, I love you. Once you came and filmed me at the Red Ledge before I was anyone, and I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm gonna try my first back 180 onto something ever, not even in the park. Hadn't even tried it, and mm -hmm. just died on the Red Ledge. On the Red Ledge. Woo! No, sorry, it was the green ledge when it was painted oh, red. Okay. So whoa, it was painted, huh? My, the the like the brother of the red, red ledge. The just brother, up, just up the road, just up the road. The little sister. Of so the looking sister. back at that, the chicken head part, are you still? Obviously, it's still something you're thinking about, and no, it's not something I'm thinking about. I just remember being like building up to and like honestly too like it was probably because they didn't have enough shots or whatever but when you're like why didn't they maybe they I don't know I don't I wasn't there yeah. um it was obviously because they had to be in the video and they didn't have enough shots or whatever that's what I was told it was just how does it make me feel now it's not what that chicken head part made me feel it's what every every one of these um experiences kind of like are just like oh it's like such a like let down because you think it's into a yeah into a bigger letdown huh? i have a topic that i think is cool so you know i think I, I find myself as i get older i look at at people and who they are and i think about like do i want what they have do i want what the sacrifices that it takes to do such things do i want like sure this person might be the greatest snowboard of all time but are they happy or this or that that's getting a little deep and off the rails but what what i want to talk about is like you know the amount of slams and sacrifice that you've taken for this sport and like thinking about because i think a lot of times people say oh my god jess she's sitting there she's she's done so well she has big budgets from sponsors or i don't know if they're thinking that but maybe and but let's think about let's talk about like what goes in behind the scenes to get there and the amount of slams and what you put your body and mind through. Cause let's list off some, in, maybe start with some injuries or you, you take, oh, it, I mean, take it from there. However you want. I, I, I was doing this like a sports psychology kind of thing. Um, the intake form. And it was like, name your injuries, all of them, even your scars. And I was like, okay, how many, I'm going to have to add like a couple pages to the back here, but I just started scanning from like top to bottom and there's something everywhere. Um, I mean, it's just countless. I don't even know if there's a point to, Majors. Let's go majors. I lacerated my liver really bad and almost died. My ribs caved in and cut it open. Um, that was before I even moved to Whistler. So, like, I've always had really bad injuries. And then there's also, like, been just a lot of really bad bails that didn't result in bad injuries. But I definitely know that I was probably known for... Oh, yeah, the, from the Think Tank movie came out. I had my own bonus section in the DVD uh, that was just bails. So... Yeah, I mean, bailed a lot. I think a lot of it was, and like, fuck me, I don't want to keep going back to this, but like, I felt like they weren't going to take us seriously. So like, you have to, like, I wanted to show how much I was willing to give. Cry button. <laughs> <laughs> 
Love the cry count. It's you good. go hard, yeah. and that's that. Yeah, and also like I've I've been in situations where the filmer didn't want to film me or was just like, oh fuck, it's cold. I don't want to get out of the van. So like if like you do your little warm up thing, and if you like hawk something crazy and like smash super hard and then get back up and run to the top of the stairs, like maybe they'll be like, oh shit, better get out and get my camera set up, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's like a, a lot of reasons for it. Also, like I just couldn't land stuff. But <laughs> you know, it's a, a, a note here, and I talk about this on the show a lot. I, I always say like, if I was a brand, if I'm looking for, uh, if I'm a talent scout per se for a brand, right, and I'm looking for the determining factor on who I would sign for like the next person on team. To me, drive is such drive is at the top. And when I hear you talk, everything goes back to drive and wherever that drive come from. But like your drive was unmatched and so you know with that drive comes i don't give a shit if i i want this so bad i don't care if i get two concussions on the spot i don't care if i blow my knee knees shoulders everything you know and that that like unsatiable drive to to for lack of a better term make it via getting these tricks is like unmatched you know and so it's just i gotta commend you on that and also realize like that's hey like you want to try to do the damn thing here's some Here's what Jess went through, you know, like here's here. And, and are you ready to go in the, ho- are you ready to spend some nights in the hospital and, and destroy your body? Cause saddle up, you know, I don't know. Just a topic I like to talk about. Well, man, it's funny. Like doing the uninvited stuff, like a lot of the girls that's, I found some girls that are like incredibly driven and are going to, and like are kind of doing the same thing to me at the spot. Like where I'm like, I'm there to film them and I'm like, holy shit. Like, should I tell them to stop? You know? Um, yeah. But then there's also the other ones who are, really have and this is like a mistake that I made in the with the early films was just like giving too much and trying to help too much and trying to prevent them from having to go through that shit you get those people that kind of expect a lot for not doing a lot and are even like uh pay for my own filmer like I have I to this day pay for my own filmer out of my pocket because I just don't want to take the chance that I'm going to go on a trip and the filmer's not going to give a shit and not film me and then they'll have an easy out oh this is why there's no chicks in the movie whatever um but yeah, there's I see people with the same drive. I think I I overcompensated so hard coming from like now it looks more likely that you might make it, but I came from like there's no fucking way. There's no way. So I'm just going to like go so far over and like go down in flames, go out swinging and be like fuck you. I'm fucking <laughs> yeah. Like, ooh, I really showed everyone just like broke my body to <laughs> That's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. But um You'd be on a trip and film her straight up. Like, you went on a trip with them to get shots and they stay in the van? Dude, I got, I've been on a... I was, like, sent on a trip to this one place where, like, the, the dudes that were there, like, I didn't really know them, but I was like, I'll just show up and shovel for them or whatever. They wouldn't answer my texts or calls all week, so I just sat in the hotel room for a week and then went home. And you <laughs> went out there to link with this crew? Yeah. Wow, that's... That's disrespectful. That's wild. Some whack shit. Yeah, I would. I would never not. Yeah, shoot no, someone you. In the crew. No, like there and there's lots of like really sick filmers out there who really like work hard. Yeah, yeah. But then and there's shoot a lot. Everything. Yeah, Should we light these fuckers up real quick. Or? No, nah, there's. That's just insane to me, though. That's like, gotten me into trouble, actually. Okay. So it's just cra- crazy to me that they're there to do a job, and that's what was crazy to me was seeing that like the work ethic that I came from and working construction was like you run. I was running. Like I actually I remember my boss saying. I've never seen anyone run on a construction site, but I was fucking running because I didn't want to lose my job. And I wanted them to think maybe we could hire a girl next time because the chicks are going to run, you know? Um, it goes back to what Chris said. You got that drive. It's just yeah. ingrained. Where does it come from? She's Getting kind of shot been ha- down. hammering on that. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, you were like this for your whole life too, right? At a young age. I was hearing an interview like you taught yourself how to read super young. And oh yeah, where did you read that? We have our we do deep we do deep dive. dive. We do a deep dive. Um yeah, always been driven for something. I always had this like this fire that had to go somewhere. I don't know what it is or where it came from. And even now, like it's in me. That's why I keep crying. I love it. It's yeah, passion coming out. It's I mean, it passion. sounds like you're just born with it. Yeah, maybe. I have a question for you. I ta- I was talking to uh, Ben Bullock, and Hi. he he mentioned she, he's he used the word people pleaser. Do you, would you consider yourself a people pleaser? 
I would consider myself the right people pleaser, maybe, or maybe the wrong people pleaser, but, like, I'm also, like, fuck you to a lot of people as well. I do want to, it's not, like, people pleaser, it's, like, position pleaser. Oh, that sounds really whack. That's Um, not sexual position. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's, uh, (coughs) if I'm given a chance to do something, I just want to fucking kill it at it. 100% 100% and go further than anybody else would then I can sleep at night and know like I didn't waste any opportunities so yeah I probably do I probably like don't say no enough for sure mm-hmm. I don't say no enough and I even like invent ways to go way overboard where I shouldn't and it's not even and then people expect that from you you know Beautiful. I'm gonna jump into a quick Patreon, yeah, hit a Patreon question <clears throat> this is from David Baldwin Please shed some light into the female male pay difference in snowboarding. I mean, I think if you're at the top, it's probably not that different. I don't know. Um, I mean, I know a lot of guys who aren't getting paid much, and maybe like a lot of people would really like slam me for this or disagree. But um, the, it's not the pay difference when you're like at the top level. It's just that there's nothing below that. But I think it's changing. As we speak, it's changing. And, yeah, that's where I think that the difference is. The AM women basically are getting nothing. Yeah, there. well, there's nothing for them to shoot there's for. There's no budget left. But then yeah. if you're on the top tier. You're getting probably paid, like, as much or almost as much as the, 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 your equal, like, dudes. Do you think there's women making as much as the top, top men? Yes. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Jamie Anderson. Yeah, Jamie Anderson's a perfect sure. example. Some, that Some women that do really well. <clears throat> but if you're am, you have nothing. Nothing. I mean, I can't speak to pride. You got my travel budget. You got a percentage of that. Um, but I can't speak to the contest scene at all because I'm not in it. Yeah. I guess I'm just talking about like endorsement contracts from companies like Monster and Nike and stuff. Um, I never asked anyone else what they were getting. I think like the numbers that they threw out, I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Just quick, can you sign a paper with that before <laughs> you like retract it, you know? Well, I think the contest, the endorsements, they're getting a lot of money. If you're winning an Olympic gold and you get a McDonald's commercial, you're getting some cheddar. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I think it's time to get into Liquid Death's spinning wheel of death. Now, the thing, before we get into it, I want to talk about uh, Liquid Death because I'm not a fan of murder, but you know what I am a fan of? Cans, crushing them. Murdering my thirst. Murdering your thirst. Exactly, okay, bud. got that. Wow. And, and almost went over my head. Oh, yeah, almost <laughs> over your head. I love crushing cans. I Death usually drink plastic. about uh, 16 to 18 of these things an episode. Uh, Bud's has been urinating like an absolute yeah, racehorse. you've seen me. Um, because he's hydrated. I'm uh, about four of these deep. Yep. I got a new little trick, dude. I've been throwing a lime in my carbonated ones just wow. on top. Almost tip, like if you were tip. drinking Corona. Mm-hmm. Definitely ups it a notch. You know what I like about water. these look like a beer as well. You yes. know what I like about them though is I don't get blacked out and like get a DUI if I drive. No, this. you just wake up hydrated. Uh, exactly, I love it. <laughs> so I think it's time to get into the liquid death spinning wheel of death. Here we go. Welcome to the liquid death. Death, death, death. Spinning wheel of death. You know whose voice that is? You, Raykeon. That was Mikey LeBlanc. Oh, so wow. You, or you can't, all, your shoulder's messed up. So you give this thing a spin. Give it a hard spin. Yeah, you got to you gotta spin it good. Like, and then uh, we'll do what it lands on. Okay. So the camera can see it. Blind touch test. Okay, guys. We're going to get into our blind touch test. Now, I think we should maybe... Do you want to hit a run-through-a-wall smelling salt before to kind of wake your senses up? Um, yeah, sure. Okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll pop it, or I'll hand it to you. You squeeze it. There, there it is. I'll she knows it. the drill. Okay. There it goes. <laughs> 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 I couldn't find my nose. She okay, went deep. I hit it. Okay, Here, take on. it. You see item, one, item one's going to be easy. Grab it. Oh, where is it? It's on the ground. We're good. Okay, we're good. Okay, item one. Um, here we go. I'm going to hand it to you. Okay. She has item one in her hand. Oh, it's a shovel. No, it's an egg. <laughs> <laughs> that good. Just like that. It's that easy, huh? Okay. Oh, item two. Oh, Phil the dog just came in here. Phil, out. This 
is a toy. That's correct. That's correct. But what is it? Uh, is it a bug? Nope. Face? Is it a... <laughs> it's something that... in the Oh, wind- it's got a track on the bottom. It's a sled. Wow. It's a sled. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's this awesome. just, that was there's really, like, really this good. This isn't the T3. It's like the T mu- T0. Yeah, that's old Because I school. couldn't feel the lugs. That's, a, that's like an 03 Summit. Yeah. I'll take that out of your hands. And lastly, she may go three for three here, folks. Lastly, here you go. Ooh. Oh, I mean, it's a wig. Oh, oh wow. wow. Okay. That's awesome. All right, three for three. You can take the blindfold off. That was, that, that was that Two was of those fun. were meatballs, though. Were they? Yeah. Uh, it's hard to say. That's our first time doing it. We yeah, don't really have any data to say okay. on what's a meatball and what's not. So, um, congratulations. I don't know what to do no, with this egg. What do we do with the egg? Egg toss. Yeah, we can do egg toss. I got a trash can back here. Egg toss in the booth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Jess, that was a fantastic job. Thank you. By the way, all of the suggestions on that board were actually from, we did an Instagram poll, what should we have on the Liquid Death Spinning Wheel of Death? Every single thing that was on there was commented by you guys. So, you know, again, podcast fueled by the people. Community driven. Speaking of that, our our Patreon is our community. Yes. Let's Let's, hit the Patreon question. Let's throw a uh, Patreon question out here. All right, this one is from uh, Benny Pellegrino. Do you think there is room in the future for all female snowboard brands? Female snowboard brands? I mean, they already exist. A few. Uh, oh, I just think he's the talking hard goods. snowboard, got it, got hard it, goods. It, yeah. I don't think there's been actually a, a board brand that's all only female. There was Chorus, wasn't there? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, like two hundred years ago. And they only made for female boards. Yeah, it was like. I remember Jana, Shannon. Oh, they all rolled for chorus, huh? Maybe. I don't know. I had the posters. But um, is there room? What, I don't know. I don't really think there needs to be. Just all brands should accommodate all people? Well, not all brands should anything. Just do I Do I think there... Read the question again. And it's from Benny who, Pellegrino, who is... Shout out, huge Benny. product background. You know him, I'm sure. Do you think there is room in the future for all female snowboard brands? No, I think there shouldn't be room for all female anything in anything because then it like takes away from the talent and um, it just doesn't feel legit if if they're just like, yeah, everyone, everyone come on in. That makes sense. Okay, I have a question. Okay. And it's in regards to your marketing campaigns for <laughs> the uninvited. Now, uh, if you guys don't follow Jess or The Uninvited on Instagram, she uses memes. Where do you get your inspiration for these incredible memes? Maybe you can send us a few if you have them on your phone, and we'll showcase them on the screen as you're talking. That would be cool. Yeah, okay. Um, I, well, where do I get them? I mean, it started during the pandemic when we were just literally, like, sitting there scrolling to see like when the world was ending like right when it started and everyone was in lockdown um and everyone was posting like all this stuff that was kind of stressful and like their own opinions or their own whatever conspiracy theories or whatever and I was like I'm just gonna like throw up the most ridiculous shit with absolutely no context and I just kept doing it and I thought it was funny um so that started like the memeing thing and, and like where do I get them I just have an app that downloads stuff off Instagram. So I will just scroll through and then like the algorithm obviously knows me and sends me um, just the most ridiculous shit. Um, And yeah, I just like at any given time. I also, oh yeah, during, I also like unfollowed a lot of like snowboarding things, unfollowed a lot of like serious accounts because I was like, I just wanted, I didn't want to sit there stressing out that I was like missing out on filming and all this stuff, you know? So I just followed a bunch of meme accounts and like followed certain cats and dogs or pigs or uh, hedgehogs that I was stoked on. Um, (laughs) And and yeah, so I just got into that. And then when it came around time to marketing the uninvited, we don't really have like a marketing budget and also marketing stuff. Just I was like, oh, it's so cheesy, the kind of stuff. I just kind of want to make it like a joke or like get my message across um, without 
saying like girls this women this you know just like just some funny shit I wanted to make people laugh because there hasn't been enough laughter there's never enough but this past year there's definitely not been enough and oh yeah yeah so Absolutely. bad year for laughter yeah. bad year for laughter we need <laughs> laughter to, stocks are low those, r- those are rookie numbers you need to get the laughter numbers out. yeah now I'm curious what uh what, what's a good follow for a gentleman uh in his mid-30s looking to laugh on the internet yeah, you, you got, got a good you, meme account you, to throw out there fuck, there's so many um there's some really good gay meme, meme accounts out there mm-hmm. that are really fucking funny saint hoax is one mm-hmm. s-a-i-n oh you guys follow that uh, not that one, but I do follow some other uh, funny gay meme accounts. Uh, Barry's Banter Bus is another one. Um, great name, by the yeah, way. Yeah, great name. Barry's Banter Bus. I love that. <laughs> and you follow straight dog accounts and cat yeah, accounts. Yeah, if, <laughs> if they're like putting out good content, you know. It's awesome that dogs have their own accounts these days. I didn't know hedgehogs were in the mix. Yeah. Dude, everything's in the mix. Everything. Everything. I've seen pigs and monkeys. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. But no hedgehogs. That's tight. That's beautiful. Well, that's also another footnote. It's like... Okay, let's, as much as it sucks, I hate talking about Instagram, but we, I personally tend to look at it too much. I think a lot of people do. And, uh, like, take a gauge on how things make you feel. You're like, oh, yeah, this, I don't like the way this makes me feel. I'm going to, it's, yeah, you don't need to follow up. And sometimes you don't even know, you don't even realize how it's making you feel. You just, like, get off your phone and you're in a bad mood or you're just like, oh, I suck. Mm-hmm. But I think stuff, if you make it, like, fill your, it, it's the same, like, I want to fill my life with positive people and ridiculous people and people that make me laugh, so I fill my feed, because I have to be on it, you know, it's part of the job, for sure, and mm-hmm. that's another thing, is, like, I thought it would be so funny, to, and it, like, I thought it would be just funny to, like, you know, I can't do all those posts all the time that are, like, me, me, look at me doing a handstand or whatever on a fucking sunset rock. But I can post fucking stupid memes and, and feel good about <laughs> and it and feel good about it. Cause it's like, this is like, I don't like, I don't need someone else to be like, Oh, look at what you're doing. Like who cares? But look at something and laugh and like be able to send it to your friends and laugh. And like, it's not, I don't create the content at all. It creates itself and it's already created or like, I'll just put a new spin on it or put a different song to it. And, that's what the people need in these yeah. these uh, trying times. I think yeah. that's great, hundred percent. And that's also an interesting one too. Like I think that uh, you know, if I know, like when shit's hitting the fan, humor is such a great. I don't want to say coping mechanism, but way to coping ma- mechanism. Yeah, make yeah. Absolutely. make yourself able to get out of a shitty situation. Like when you're in a shitty situation, sled breaks down and you're fucking twenty miles back, and everything's going wrong, and there's the one guy that's freaking out. You're like, but then like. Yeah, fuck that guy. Like, just you want you want to be around the guy that's like making light of the situation. Totally, you know, or yeah. or girl or whoever for that matter. Don't do that. <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to do that. Well, I not today at least. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm trying trying to be a little more aware. That's all. You know. When you okay. say guys, it's the crew. It's inclusive. Yeah, that's I'm starting I, to that's wonder. That's how I understand it. Like, I start all my emails with like, "Hey guys," or like, "You guys." Dude, we've been told that that's like offensive. I know, but and we've also been told chicks is offensive and everything's. Look at me, then. You've I'm been offending. Going you're down offending in a lot of people, so just be careful. I just want you to be careful out there. I think <laughs> <laughs> I want you to be careful out there. <laughs> I think that there's something to be said for not being included, because if you're just like getting your butthole fluffed from the time you enter till the time you leave you're not even going to realize like you're not first of all you're not going to learn how to fight to get somewhere and like m- maybe some people will say people shouldn't learn how to fight but like if I don't think that being welcomed from the start helped me get better at snowboarding I think the opposite is true and it's hard to see it in the moment where you're like oh this this sucks or I'm not included or I don't see myself there it's like Something to fight for. Uh, Spite boarding. I want to. I want to get your take on something because I, I. And this maybe you know comes from a place of uh, privilege, I guess you could say, which is, uh, you know, for whatever you can. I understand why I'm the devil in a lot of senses, but because of or not. That's a. Let me retract that. I, I, I'm not. I understand that. Like I, you know, if we're on this privilege talk and stuff, we're white males. We don't have a. We don't have a place to to. We don't have a leg to stand on in a lot of these conversations, right? Because we don't we don't know 
there's not a lot for us to complain about in some senses. How, however, in some senses, my my thing in a lot of like the way I frame a lot of things, not in regards to like gender, but in regards to what happens in life. And these are two separate conversations as I'm thinking about it. But like life just isn't fair sometimes. Like things happen in life, and life. I've always viewed like life's not fair. Yeah, that happened. Life's not fair. Like it's just not like I've lost a close friend and that's not like in my mind, it's like, that's not fair. There's not, there's no fairness. Well, that's just, when you really it, find it, out that life's not things, fair. things happen. Things happen in life. And like, I guess there's like this and, and maybe I guess it's ignorant when I compare it to, to like, you shouldn't have gender and things that are like workplace equality. That doesn't really, that, that sentence shouldn't just be like, well, life's not fair. But like in, in a lot of sentences, like in, like in a lot of instances in life, like it's just like, if you're born in fucking, like Mexico in a slum and you're born in Beverly Hills, like it's life's not fair. There's two different things, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm wording that, but do you have anything to add to that sentence or do you feel any sentiment around that? Um, I think that if you think life is supposed to be fair, then you're going to be disappointed over and over again and like bombed and just live your life feeling like you're getting fucked over. Um, I think that actually getting fucked over when you're younger is, and I, it took me a while to realize this. Um, a lot of people aren't equipped to deal with hardship. And so then when it finally happens, it like fucks you up. And I think that the m earlier you realize that like part of life is shitty stuff for sure. It's not just like, Oh, this thing happened to me. You know, I'm a victim. <sighs> There's not that it's a contest, but there's bigger victims. There's bigger shit going on in the world. Like yesterday I was in the airport and like a, a guy was in the wheelchair ready to get pushed away. And of course the resources are like low right now. Like whatever, they're getting back into the swing of things. And he's like, this is not how you treat a first class customer. Like he's just yelling and sitting in his wheelchair waiting to be pushed because there's other people in front of him to be pushed. And like, it was just like, I was like, I wanted to be like, yo dude, shut the fuck up. And same with, like, this other guy on the plane who's, like, fucking Mexicans, like, do, putting me through security twice. Like, what is this shit? Like, it's entitled. They're just verbally spraying this stuff? Yeah, and I was, but it was, like, it was, like, I mean, I don't know, it's supposed to be some fucking lesson for me, but I also wanted to be, like, shut, you shut the fuck up. Dude, like, that's not inconvenience, you know? But then I was, like, okay, going back to, like, the right way of thinking for me is like these people are living their lives super upset all the time, feeling fucked over all the time, feeling like a victim all the time. And so I think there's something to be said for like the perspective that can be gained from, I don't even remember what the original question was. Well, yeah, it's really all your perspective, right? Of how you're going to approach your perspective life. Perspective of things being day. fair is what we were talking about. Things being fair. Yeah. Life's not fair. Well, also another, another value. And what is fair too? Yeah. I mean, fair, fair, fair is around an expectation. You expect yeah. things to be a certain way, and they're not that way. That that's what dictates fair. I think it's built around expectation. Mm -hmm. But going back uh, to kind of what we were saying earlier, you know, I think as humans, our fucking brains, male, female, trans, whatever thing you identify or don't identify as, our fucking brains as humans are set up to look for problems. You're just like all day. Like, what, what, what are the problems? I find myself looking for problems all day long. What is this? Like, and we have to fucking work hard to not sabotage our crazy rat trap to focus on the problems in our life. I think every human, whether you're a millionaire in Beverly Hills or you're the poorest person in the country, no matter what, our brains are wired the same to look for problems. So whether or not we are, you know, some problems are bigger than others, although it's all, it's all circumstantial, we all have problems. And so we all are dealing with the same thing. And then to de so to devalidate other people's problems, oh, your problems aren't like my problems. You don't know my problems, this and that. Like we all go through it. You know, we all have problems. So I think it's like, it's kind of in some senses, sure, we don't know how to relate to certain circumstances, but like, you know, that, like to think, I think as humans, we, we all deal with that. Do you have Totally. Any? I mean, I think that when you're saying that, I was like, oh, that would make sense from a, what's that word for, uh, from an evolutionary perspective that, we would be looking for problems because we're looking for like um, things that are unsafe that could threaten our safety. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking like when you're out um, however long ago, like yeah. out in the bush looking for like a cougar that's going to come mm -hmm. get you. And that's just like stuck in us to look for problems. That's our 
but I think that to try to like remember like I'm pretty safe you know I'm pretty mm -hmm. safe my actual life isn't threatened by this thing and um probably be happier I mean I haven't cracked the code nope. to happiness or whatever but I think it's a daily fight for everybody to like, and, and, uh, it, like it's, there's uh, some people are wake up and it's, it's easier, I think than others. And it, it all depends. But like, I think there's, we have to like all work pretty hard for our sanity. I think in general, like find those things like snowboarding, surfing, biking, reading, whatever that is, like you kind of have to fight to like keep your brain from trying to self-sabotage. I think most humans I've talked to and met in my life suffer from a similar thing. And, and going back, I think it could be a good place to pivot into uh, your project, uh, Learning to Drown, I believe is the title. And it's fucking, for you guys listening, uh, Jess has a short film that is unbelievable. It is like a bell curve of emotions where you, I was bawling my eyes out. I was inspired. And by the end, I was so fucking motivated. Like it was just, it was fucking so powerful. I really believe that this thing is going to be bigger than snowboarding. I think it's just going to be like a mainstream documentary that everybody can love. Everybody can appreciate the story's unreal. And, and in that, um, you know, you equate, we can talk about it some more, but one thing in particular that pertains to what we're talking about, you talked about how, um, I think it was like emotions were like a wave. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, because I had never spent any time in the ocean. I was scared to death of water. And then something really significant happened in my life. My partner passed away. And I was just so fucked. And I felt like I was literally, I like it sounds cliche, especially with the title now. But like, I felt like I was drowning. I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I just wanted to like rip my skin off and run screaming. Um, which I kind of did end up running screaming down to Mexico. Um, his mom lived down there. And that was something that we had talked about doing and I got in the water because I was I hit a point where I was like fuck it I don't care if I die I don't care I'm not scared of anything anymore because like the worst thing that could have happened has already happened and so I like threw myself into trying to learn how to surf and I never knew like what it was like to get pinned down what it was like to not be able to breathe and all that stuff and I and I just like found so many analogies while I was out there just getting my shit kicked that I realized that it, like I was I used to be scared to put my head under the water that was the biggest thing even in a bathtub like I would lay back and like put my head in and be like one two three four five six seven ah! and then jump up but I realized by like trying to keep my head on the surface all the time I was just like choking in the foam and and like too caught in between being able to breathe and being not able to breathe and once I just accepted that I could dive down and hold my breath and just accept that, like, I'm not going to be able to breathe for this next part, it is going to pass. There's no, like, there, in physics, yeah, maybe another one is going to smash you, but that one is going to pass. Um, and that was, like, a huge kind of, I don't know, I came to all these crazy realizations there that, you know, I, I think I took for granted at the time because I was, like, the only thing I wanted was for him to come back. But guess I have to just like dive down and accept that like he's not going to be here right now. And this life will pass and I think I'll see him again. Yeah, I can only imagine how difficult the ex acceptance struggle. Well, I mean, I'm be. pretty sure you can't imagine. What? I'm pretty sure you can't imagine. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Has he come back to you in your dreams at all? So for the first year, he didn't at all. Maybe I just had nightmares every night. Every fucking night. It was terrible. Like, he'd be there, but he'd do something. Like, I'd be like, oh, my God, I thought you were dead. And he's like, no, no, no. Like, I, I, and then he would, like, I'm here. And then he would do something so stupid and end up going to jail for the rest of his life. So it's like he was there, but I wasn't able oh, to be God. with him. Or he'd come back and he'd, like, not want to hang out with me he wanted to hang out with and I know that sounds funny that those are nightmares but it was like or he had faked his own death like for a lot of the period I like thought in my head like maybe he has because I couldn't like I, I was on a lot of drugs too but like I couldn't differentiate between those dreams and reality because I just felt like I was living in a nightmare anyways so, and then people would be like, oh, like to try to make me feel better oh I dreamt about Mark last night you know he came to me this and that and I'm just like fuck you 
Like, and I was like, bitch, where are you? Like, why are you coming to these people you don't even know? Like, but I think that a lot of it was he knew that you can't, you're just going to be in limbo if you, you're going to keep someone in limbo. And I did hang on to like going to the psychics and all this stuff. Like, again, like, wow, as I'm saying this, I'm realizing like, it's just like trying to breathe in the whitewash where it's like, dude, just go down, just fucking give up. And I think he just knew that it was like, it wasn't going to help, even though I, that's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. But if I would have gotten a piece of that, then I would have just hung on to that. And I remember him. And I mean, for the people out there who don't believe in this, I don't give a shit. Fuck you. I believe in it. That's why I, I asked. Me too. Yeah. He, he was there in the first, like not in my dreams, but like I could feel him and I would be having conversations with him like right after it happened. And one day I was just like, fuck you, fuck off. If you can't be here for real, like go away, fuck you. See ya. Like I couldn't take it anymore and he left. And then I was like, oh, just joking. <laughs> come back. He actually felt oh. him leave. That's, that's heavy. I just, he didn't come. Before he was like with me the almost all the time, like I could mm -hmm. feel him behind me. Like, mm -hmm. But I mean, I think that's what I needed even though I was like really pissed at him. And then... Once I actually, like, did some more work on, like, processing it and stuff, like, he w has come into my dreams, and there has been times where there was a couple times, not in a dream, but I would wake up. As I was waking up, I'd hear his voice, like, so loud. It would wake me up, and I remember him saying, like, I'm always with you, Jess. It was, like, clear as fucking day, and I, like, shot out. Of I was sleeping in the back of my car, just passed out on a fucking bender at Hood, I think. But I was like, that, like, where, fuck. But those things just let you, keep you hanging on to something that you can't have. I don't even remember what the question was. No, Again. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter <laughs> yeah. what the question was. I, uh, you know, fuck this whole thing. Like, <clears throat> there's so many powerful words. And, and I, I, you know, how do you learn to live with somebody you can't live without? I always, that hit so hard and. And, you know, there's obviously, like, so much intense, intense trauma and suffering and, and um, you know, things, things of that nature. And, and going back, um, you know, I think that I wanted to just touch back on that wave analogy because I feel as though, you know, anybody that has struggled with depression or is in a, is in a dark time in their life, like, you feel a wave of depression come over and you hold on so tight. Like you're like, no, 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 no. I'm losing my, I'm losing my fucking happiness. Oh no. Like, and you hold on so tight for your, for your depression or when you're happy, you're like, no, 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 it's, I'm getting sad. No, no, no. I can't let this go. And then, and so like the, the understanding of like this too shall pass, they say, but you explain it so eloquently with the, with the waves, you know, it's like, can we try to put that into words again? Exactly. I mean, I think anyone I'm saying this remembering what it was like being from Canada and having no idea what like a wave did or I didn't know mm -hmm. there was different parts to it or whatever. Um, but I would encourage anyone who's able to, to ever go to the ocean if it's safe and there's like no rip currents, <laughs> mm -hmm. get in there and get tossed around a bit um, and try different things to get thrashed around less um, that might go against your intuition. But I mean, I, the wave thing is just... You have to, everything, nothing, like, this is, like, a fact of physics. Nothing lasts forever. So, and this is something, like, I, after Mark passed away, I hit up Rory Bushfield, who was Sarah Burke's husband. And I was, like, how? What, like, how? And he's, like, when my dog died when I was little, my dad told me, like, nothing lasts forever. Nothing good, nothing bad. My relationship with Sarah, your time here with Mark. And the bad, the, but the thing is, like, that goes all the way across the board for the bad things, too. And you might not, even, like, I still have problems, like, telling myself, look, this isn't going to last. Like, but however brutal those, like, super shitty moments are where you're like, I don't even want to live. It is going to pass. It may not, like, completely go away, but it's, I think it's important to remember that it absolutely cannot, like, you can't defy physics. It's not going to last forever. And you just got to hold on and let it pass. And if you can, just, like, go down deep and just fucking hold hold your breath if you have to, you know. It's going to pass. You know, it's a good thing. I've 
remember going through hard times in my life and thinking a year from today, I'm going to feel completely different. Like if you can, if you can get yourself there and be like, this is horrible, but like have the bigger picture. Like you said, this too shall pass. And same goes for the good times too. You know? Yeah. Um, like enjoy the, enjoy the fuck out of those. Cause those are going to, that's a really good um, tip that I'm going to use because I still struggle with like these dips that are mm-hmm. bad. But when you said, like, think of where you'll be in a year, I think I would more, like, think of where I was a year ago. And Mm -hmm. you will be like, where was I a year ago? What the fuck even? And so the fact that it was so insignificant now, a year later, that you don't even remember, like, maybe that will humble you and give you some perspective on, like, this moment is going to pass and you probably won't even remember it. Mm -hmm. It, Oh, man, another another thing that just I wanted, I was so fired up. I love... Your, your movie so much it, I was so fired up by the end I love that that bell curve of just of oh my, I've been saying bell curve a bunch today just a fucking random a couple times. Times. yeah I have no idea why I'm like <laughs> bell curve I'm a, a bell curve guy I guess we're gonna beat that to death today no but um like you know you said something along the lines of like you know we've said on the show too something along the lines of you you basically got to do it for the people that can't you know I know if Mark was here he'd be balls balls out hair hair back and like i listen i heard that and i'm like i want to i like my my reaction was like i want to get on my dirt bike and fucking jump the biggest double i can like i want to go get I some jump on my dirt bike and rip my dick open <laughs> yeah. almost almost, almost my dick did open. yeah i almost did do that recently <laughs> but um no it just like gave me this like <gasps> like i think that that message is so important because it's like our time is precious we gotta get after it while we're here if that's what you want to do if that's what you you aspire to do, you know, if you aspire to chill, do that too. But if you want to get after it, fucking get after it while we're here. Yeah, you know, go do all the things that you want to do now. Why not now? Mm-hmm. And that's why I went to Mexico. Like, I didn't really want to go. I just wanted to stay home in a dark room and sleep, you know. But I was mm-hmm. like, oh, I can sleep on the beach down there. Mm-hmm. So. And now that now your story, now, like, not to say your story, but, you like, every, the whole the amount of it's it's easy to crawl into a hole in those situations and just be depressed you have to fight you have to fight for your happiness and your i don't want to say freedom but your your willingness to to live and and so now it's like you've been you've inspired so many women through just your snowboarding and and everything else and then overcoming this it's like you know that there's so much fucking goddamn inspiration there Jess it's huge well i want to you know? say that there's no overcoming this because when you expect that and that's still something I'm struggling with I was like oh, I thought I was good because like this thing this this premiere thing like the the movie isn't out to the public yet but it did premiere for the first time at Tribeca like last month and I was like oh no I'm gonna have to live through I didn't hadn't watched it very much because it was like traumatizing not just like the mark thing but watching all the bales and being like damn I did that to myself mm-hmm. I, it made me bummed on myself. I was like, oh, dude, I thought you were, like, over this. You know, you quit the drugs. You quit the running. You quit the all the bad shit that I was doing to cover it up. But it's still not fixed. And it probably will never be. And I think, like, being able to accept that is something I need to work on next. And, like, another thing I was thinking about what you just said that when you said, like, the fight. You, There are times in life where you should fight. I think that there was a lot of times in my life where I didn't have to fight, but I just thought I did. Mm. Um, and something that I always say to people, a lot of people hit me up and be like, oh, I've lost this person in my life that's really important to me. Like, like same way I hit up Rory. And I always say, you know, you don't have to do anything. There's no fucking fix for it. Just mm-hmm. keep existing. Hold on. Mm-hmm. Keep existing. And it will get softer. It's not going to get like, fucking rad (laughs) you're never gonna be like woo but all you have to like you don't have to do anything just fucking stay here because that was the hard i think that's the hard part for anyone who loses someone like being left behind is fucked the people left behind are the ones that suffer yeah and i i think you're right you never you never get past it you just learn how to live with it yeah I had a trauma like 15 years ago, and I still have moments that you you look, reflect on it, and 
you're still sad as hell. It's just a matter of learning how to live with it and move on and get past the really dark moments, like you're saying. And I guess accept the the dark moments that come back on you. I don't know. I'm still trying. Like, I'm still working on it. That's one thing with the film. It's, like, got this, like, happy. It's got this happy vibe to it at, at points, you know, that I just want to make sure that people know, like, don't beat yourself up if you're still struggling, even after, like, because I'm doing it. Last week I was doing it. <laughs> And being like, how am I going to let people see this and have them think like, oh, I fucking, I won the battle, whatever, and I have it. Like, I feel, but I got to take my own advice. And you know what's funny is I, when I first watched it, I was fucking destroyed (laughs) for like a month um, because I didn't expect any of that. The guy that, Ben Knight, who edited it is is a fucking genius and that is name. that's powerful dude he made the bell curve i didn't make no bell curve but i forget what i was just saying i was just thinking about watching it it made you, you oh yeah okay so i was like having a really low point which is like so frustrating for me because i've tried to do everything i can to deal with the depression and not just depression from mark depression from hitting my head depression from so many things and I I had to watch it because I had to like Ben hit me up and was like yo anything else you want to change you got to tell me because we're submitting it like tomorrow and so I left it to like or like at the end of the week I left it to the very last day and I was like fuck I do not want to watch this right now I don't want to deal with this I don't want to look at this and then I watched it and came out of it and was like so (laughs) so inspired I was like I cried the whole time. It was just like, well, I mean, obviously that's not a unique occurrence, but um, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, like there's hope. I can do this. Like I just have to fucking, I can do this. Like this is who you are. Like this is not who you are. Or no, this is who you are. <laughs> All fucked up and unable to cope. But I came out of it, liter- this sounds so cocky, but like I came out of it feeling so much better and being like, like it inspired me because you have to understand that yourself in different points of your life could totally inspire yourself Mm -hmm. in low points of your life. And I was, it's a really rare thing to be able to like see everything lined up on film, you know, but um, I really came out of it because I was having some fucked up thoughts that week and like, yeah, it was crazy. I was after I was like, I called Van, I'm like, dude, I, I know this sounds stupid, but like, I just got so inspired and I thought I feel hope now for mm-hmm. the first time in a long time, but it was like me. So mm-hmm. like, I just want to say like anyone out there, I'm not unique. If I lined up all of the shitty things that happened in either of your guys' lives or anyone out there down to like the fucked up shit that happened to us when we were kids and all that stuff and put it in a film, it's going to be moving. And you're going to look back at that and be like, wow, that's what I went through. That's, and it's so easy to forget all that stuff, especially traumatizing stuff. Cause you just stuff it away. So, I don't know. Take a lesson from that. Well, that's uh, there's so much amazing things there, and and I think that uh, when I hear you say, you know, like I love that point. That's like you never get there. You're never just like I made it. I'm good, right? And and that's that goes for anything. I think as well as like you know, you have people that are trying to seek inner contentment. Uh, you know, people just want to learn how to live. I think that's why people listen to some podcasts. They want to maybe learn how to live a little bit better. They want to learn how to take a piece of this and apply it to their life. And one thing I like that I found in, in my journey of knowing nothing fucking, but trying to figure it out is like, at first I thought you get there. If I just like read enough and maybe I like work out and I can kind of like find this balance, maybe like, and, and I work on myself, I'm just going to like get there. But you, you never, you never get there. You take the good with the bad and you just try to can incrementally get better and do little things here, there, but you never, you never, there's, it's like a false dream to sell. Like I made it. I'm good. I made it out. You know, you don't, it's a false dream. Cause you, you just try to f- get, figure out how to live better every, every day. And incrementally, maybe yesterday th- wasn't as bad as two months ago or whatever, you know? But that's such a, a an important thing. And another thing I was on the regards to loss and things of that nature, you know, lost a really, really close friend. And and we have 
it's it's not nowhere. It's not, I'm not trying to compare in any way. This has nothing. But uh, one thing I've noticed is that like everybody's healing process looks different. Everybody is at different stages with grief and pain and, and deals with it in different ways. And that's the main thing is that's okay. That's totally okay. It's okay for one person to be processing it in this way and then the other person. It's so, so I think everybody's healing process looks different. And we forget, I don't know, like I, when you look at our friend group, I see that, you know. And it's oh, just yeah, I saw that too. Some people <laughs> use it to move forward. Some people go fucking down mm-hmm. in flames and some people are in between and some people want to blame you. Some people want to hear you stop talking about it. Even like the other day before I was like, someone was like, are you nervous about going to do the podcast? Cause I was like, oh, I don't want to think about all this shit again, you know, still how the fuck, but still. And they were like, Oh yeah, well you can just think about, think about how great things are going right now though for you. That's what they said. And I was like, I was like, okay, I get it. You don't want to hear about this anymore. Mm. You know, that's fine. I don't get to turn it off, but I mean, wow, that sounded really cunty. Um, That's true though. I mean, you can't turn it off. Yeah. And I, I get it too. Like sometimes you just don't, you're dealing with so much of your own stuff. And especially these days, people are dealing with so much stuff that you can't see, um, that they just can't take on something else. And I got to respect that too, Mm -hmm. you know? I lost my sister eight months ago to cancer, and it's almost like it's not real because of COVID. There was no funeral. And so I haven't even begun to unpack that, you know, and it's just, you, you just do it in your own. Dude, that's gnarly. Yeah, your own way, and people have their own process. And But, yeah, and COVID just made it seem like it's not real to me, basically. There was no flying home and mm-hmm. meeting with the family. And, yeah, so one day I'm sure I'm going to all of a sudden get hit like a ton of bricks and comes out in strange ways. Yeah, it comes out in strange ways in your own time and that's the young kids that come on this podcast, they haven't lived yet. They don't they don't know how life can really kick you and yeah. they'll get there They're though. worried about like yeah. the fit of your They're pants. worried about what their front board looks like. Yeah. But there's so Shit. much more. Shit, I'm still worried about that though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so worried I stopped doing that. You were talking about how you don't like to hear people in a better place and I liked what you said about, you know, if someone was Sick, it's one thing. Um, with J2, I keep always keep his photo over here. In his last moments, I witnessed that look into that better place and him making that journey. And I'm not a religious person. Walked out of there, changed. And now I do firmly believe there's, like, something going on. There has to be. So when I hear, like, he's in a better place or she's in a better place for my sister, I take, you know, I, I, I like that. It makes me feel good and... Also makes me know, man, I'll probably, like, I think you're going to see him again, you know? Like, I have 100% faith you're yeah. going to see oh, him I again. Oh, I know I'm going to see him again. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't I don't mean to, s- like, I think that there are lots of situations where that could be comforting to hear, like, oh, they're in a better place. When you're watching two is, like, so sick. Yeah, yeah someone better is to suffering be in that and, or just, like, cannot figure it out on this earth. And, I mean, there was. His is too soon and the better place is with you. Yeah. But, I mean, I know that there's a, a better Okay, man, I got to fucking tell you guys this story. I had, he dropped me off at the airport and I flew to Vancouver to pick up my truck because I had to go down to Seattle and shoot this intro thing with, with Dangler. Um, on the way back, I like fell asleep in my truck at a rest stop. Like I just felt like so tired. I couldn't, I was falling asleep while I was driving. It was really weird, middle of the day. And I fell asleep in my truck and slept for like, I don't know, 30 hours or something weird. middle of the day till the yeah. night till the next day yeah and i my phone kept ringing and i was looking at the number being like this is a i don't know what number this is it's some weird i don't know probably like the medical services plan being like you're overdue on your payment kept ringing kept ringing kept ringing i kept ignoring it and finally i answered it and it was his brother and he told me just sweetie mark's dead that's what he said and i was like so I was like by myself and I was like, holy fuck, what the fuck? I got to get, I got to get to Revy right now and started driving and my phone started going off. Like it wasn't just like ding, a text. It was like ding, ding, and I was like, what the fuck? And I look at it and it was a text from him that was this picture of our canoe with like this sun burst. And it was just like the canoe sitting in like a patch of reeds. It was so 
beautiful. But I got that text and I was like, what the fuck? I kept calling his phone being like, dude, your brother, like leaving voicemails. And then weeks later, I still would randomly get that text. It would just like ding. It was so, and like I told, I told the guys that like that was making the film and we, we decided like not to put that part in. Not that it matters, but it's more just like, holy shit holy shit, like this, and it wasn't, it was like my phone was glitching, um, it was crazy, but that's what I mean, like, that kept me hanging on, and, yeah, I don't think that was a glitch, yeah, I mean, you needed that, and there it was, yeah, that's incredible, fuck on, yeah, unreal, holy shit, unreal, yeah, and, and, I still have the picture. I'll send it to you. Yeah, and it sounds like it was like a cool picture of a surreal moment. And well, it's like just the boat. I don't know. Like you know, I talked to a lot of psychics. Meant, meant Can I cross? Something. Oh. Can I cross? Oh, is that that's what the psychic said? I mean, that's what that a lot of people sense. have said. Yeah, you cross the river it's of sticks or whatever, and like the boat's there and the paddles in it, and it's just like ready to launch, just empty. And are you ready for me to launch or something? Yeah. I'm just like get. A lot of air if you do launch, dude. <laughs> Don't fucking hit the knuckle. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hit the knuckle. Yeah. Make sure you give her enough juice. Yeah. A uh, little bit of a different topic, but on your watching your movie, you nailed me this opening line almost. I have that full aquaphobia. Oh, yeah. And I told Chris about this on one of the podcasts we were talking about. My fear is like something's going to eat me. I can be in a swimming pool. I can be in a pond. And I be was honest. Like, can you be on the toilet and think something's going to reach well, out? Well, I actually researched this a little last night. And so what I have is aquaphobia. And it sounds like you have a bit of what's called a, a blutophobia, which is like even fear of when it's in the tub and bathing. Some people yeah. go as far as they won't even take baths, basically. And you have to like work your way up with a couple inches of water. There's like all this thing to it. But, yeah, when you started talking about that, like, when I was young, swimming pool, like, if no one else is in there, I'm oh, panicked. Like, could not dude, be in there. Not possible. I actually read that in 1975, Jaws came out, and tons of people got affected. No way. With aquaphobia, like, all at once, basically, because they created this deep, deep fear. And you watched it? Uh, yeah, I mean, Jaws was... I guess when everyone I was, watched it. Yeah, when I was young, I mean, I was, like, really young when I watched it. I'm sure you guys were older you when were you watched it. So I was, like, traumatized, basically. Yeah. And also when my dad taught me to swim, nice guy that he was, his move was, like, basically throw the kid off the boat, sink or swim. And that's another, like, trauma right there because you're basically either you drown or you swim. Mm -hmm. and, and you think you're dying. Yeah, and you think you're dying, basically. Not a good technique. Yeah, and that's how my dad taught us all to swim, basically throw us off a boat. <laughs> I don't swim. make it. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, so yeah, right from the beginning of your movie, I was just like, wow. Any leads on the, your reasoning where it came from? Yeah, do you have any water drama? No, because I fucking swam before I could walk. We had a pool when I was a kid. I don't know what happened. Again, I'm not that I'm going to. Some people can't this, be splashed. I've been told by someone came up to me that said they were a psychic and I. This was like not, I didn't, act, it was unprompted that, that I had drowned in a lot of, like that was a pattern for me. That I had drowned a lot. Oh, in past lives. In a past, in past life. lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I was like, I don't know, dude. That still doesn't make me be able to swim, you know? It was, like, embarrassing. Like, I wouldn't want to go to any pool party. Or like yeah. I believe that, though. The past life could have something mm -hmm. to it. 100 yeah. percent My mom was told in the past life she starved to death, and she always squirreled food away. No way. I Yeah. Like, I'd... cupboards of, like, there was always be a closet, like, stuffed with food. Totally. And as an e Egyptian or something, she like was sealed in with a pharaoh or some shit. No way. Is what the psychic told her, and that she always had a fear of uh, of of not having food, basically, and starving. It's food wild. insecurity. Yeah, pretty wild. Interesting. Leah has a crazy one where I don't remember all the details, but I remember the psychic was telling her what happened to her in a past life, and she was bawling of some because of some gnarly thing. But yeah, I mean. I love that thing about the phone, though. That's amazing. Those are those little things that really just, yeah, help you to hold the on. The canoe picture? Yeah, oh, the yeah. Canoe. yeah. And the, the and it's video crazy message. To think you slept for 30 hours, too. Yeah, I was in like dreamless sleep. Like something was happening almost, yeah. and your body knew it, but you just hadn't got the information yet. It was like a truck stop in Tukwila or something. Yeah, Tulalip. Like, that was it. I fucking could not drive past there for so long. I still hate driving past there. 
brings back the memory. Right. Wild. Uh, maybe we could dive into uh, some hot takes. Hot takes. Okay, so we kind of just, I don't want to say rapid fire, but we're going to run through a couple quick, lighthearted topics. Uh, MJ, Michael Jordan, and or slash goat of snowboarding men's and women's who you got? The MJ. Well, I watched that documentary, so I like someone, I asked someone the other day, what do you think? And they said someone, and I was like, dude, no, that's not what. Michael Jordan wanted to be there, wanted to be the best, kept going whenever, <laughs> when other people didn't. Uh, JP Walker. That's his. What are you guys, the same age or something? Yeah. We, yeah. yeah. You, you guys come from the same uh, yeah. the same time. Okay, what about... Uh, JP's on or not. Female, you got to... Well, the female thing is hard because a lot of them got kind of encouraged out or pushed pushed out before they could, like, stay forever, you know? Um, but there's, like, Jana and Tara. But then, like, my just lifetime hero, Mofo, I mean, she... Gave me, I feel like she gave me all of this. Makes sense. Yeah. Even though she like doesn't give a fuck. And after I remember being like, oh, I missed it by just a few years. Like if I could just go on one rail trip with her. But she was like, I'm out. She knows what she can do. She can do anything that she wants to do. And for that reason, she's out. (laughs) She doesn't need to try. I got to find out. I'm good. I did that shit. I'm on to some other shit. Um, So if you could see one band that are alive, which band would it be? I don't know. Okay, I'm going to say something like kind of that people, I know there's like memes about how bad this band is, but it would be Sublime probably. Oh, I because, that. <laughs> but I that it. was before I found out like Secret Peaker Pad was about smoking meth and all that. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. And then before I also like went to California and saw that exact type of long shorts and flame shirts and was like, oh, They're that's all, a different scene heads. than I thought. Yeah. yeah, to me it was like, it was like, you know, my friends getting their licenses and us like pounding that shit, driving to the hill and and hiking the pipe, you know? So yeah, probably sublime. Good answer. Uh, what do you think about the beaver slap in the lift line? Thoughts? Like where you take your board and you... Whoosh, slap you off that snow. Oh, I know. So some yeah. people don't like that, right? Um, Lifties don't like it because you ruin they, their little snow yeah, they thing. Get, they always are uh, but there. what if you're packing it in? If they built it properly, it shouldn't. That's what Ben would True. say. If they built it properly, it <laughs> shouldn't move. Little Ben, ben Belock yeah. answer. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't. I, if someone's doing it, I, I don't think I've ever been like, God, stop beaver slapping. I'm probably just like, God, get on the chair already so we can do another lap. Okay, who's your favorite current boarder on the scene? I don't know. I want to say Jill Perkins because, like, watching her is like, yes, that. Like, I, there was a long time where I felt like I had gotten to a point where, like, I wanted to see someone come and blow my fucking ass out of the water, and she has absolutely. So, and just she's just just yeah. You know, it's funny. The Jill's podcast was what I haven't snowboarded in. Uh, very much in the past couple of years because I've had these like either was working on projects that were all about other people or I've had these like insane injuries that just won't quit. I listened to her podcast like before the season started or maybe around that time. And I like, I rode more this year than in the past three years combined. Cause I forgot, I forgot what it was like she doing the little like curb. What's that? Like snowboard oh, jumping around the on the snowboard thing. addiction oh, yeah. like yeah no shame i would fucking like the, i was doing that i would draw lines on the snow before they had that thing and like i just remembered like going to the ice rink like how was i good like i started thinking i'm not good at snowboarding because when i would go so infrequently it would just be to film and i'd be like oh my god i feel so uncomfortable on my feet and i remembered like that's how i would go and do repetitions 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 and i was like that's how like i was always like how did fucking jill get so good like what is different with her? Because I'm also trying to like find the, the formula so that I can give the girls a hint to, as to like, how can they get to the next level? You know, I love to pick people's brains on stuff and listening to that episode, like fired me up and was like, I need to go snowboarding and not film. And of course, like we all say that every year, but we never end up doing it. I mean, I never end up doing it. And so like, yeah, shout out Jill for bringing it back for me. I had so much fun this year. Mm. And filmed more than I, yeah. Just backcountry stuff, though. Okay, I, I, what's your take on uh, helmets? Oh, I mean, I think that for, for people to dictate if helmets 
people should wear helmets or not is absolutely like hilarious to me coming from hilariously like absurd coming from being like so damaged um it's hitting my head is like come close to, it it uh for me it like it's like mental health stuff that like makes it way 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 worse especially like after it happens even like not even hitting it that hard, not even hitting it, just like landing and whiplashing, you know. I think that for someone to speak on behalf of someone else and say like, you shouldn't wear a helmet, helmets are whack. It's like, dude, yeah, go through what I've been through and tell me if it's whack. Go through what someone's been through where they like lose, they lose a person they love basically like because their whole personality is gone because they've hit their head so many times and like just that whole like shit about the CTE stuff I mean I haven't looked too far into it because I don't want to get paranoid but I know that you get these impulses to just want to die boom out of nowhere weird had a great day but today I just can't be alive anymore and like that's what we're talking about we're not talking about looking cool so but I mean that comes with perspective head smashes and and whatever so I think my perspective on helmets is like and I mean, people used to tell me this and I was like, hell no, I'm not wearing one. But because someone told me like, oh, they won't run photos in mags and they won't put you in the videos if you're wearing a helmet. And that was like the old way. But I remember at one point, me and Desiree were on a trip to Quebec with Carlino and we were like, fuck it, we're wearing helmets. And so we did. And I feel like for there was like a period after that for girls that it was like cool to do it. And I was like, that's really, that's cool. You know, I still like, honestly, I hate wearing a helmet. It's just another thing to put on. Um, but anyways, yeah, you open that wormhole. That's my perspective on helmets. No, I wear a, one. It's a great wormhole. So do I. I think it's great. Um, you know, people with uh, TBIs are 2.5 times more likely to end up in prison. Really? Than people without. Just like the impulsivity. Yeah, you so lose. So 2.5x, so 200% is what you're saying when you say 2.5 times. Yep. Yeah, holy, 250% more. Because you lose that shit. impulse control yeah. and you, where one person might be, okay, I'm not going to snap. Where the head injury person might snap and hurt somebody, and Makes boom, sense. they're in prison. Dude, I've yeah, I've experienced some of those things. Very um, impulsive and quickly irritated, and things of that nature. Hundred percent. Yeah, no, that's a great topic, and uh, and also, the, I mean, we don't have to go down too too deep, but uh, like the more you hit it, the easier it is to get one. That's the thing too. Sometimes yeah. people don't realize. Um. Okay, I love that. So one thing you kind of touched on, and, and maybe you answered this, but like it, <clears throat> we can skip over this if, if, if we answer this. So you kind of discussed that, that you went away from snowboarding and you came back. And, you know, what would you say, like, the, what made you fall back in love with snowboarding? It seems like, it, did you fall back in love with snowboarding, A, and, and B, what, it, what made you do that? Yeah, so a long, for a long time, snowboarding was associated with, like, suffering for me. I I remember feeling like I was a kind of like a jock or kook or sellout or whatever because people would always be, like, talking about how much fun they were having, and I was never having fun, really. Like, I felt like I couldn't afford to have fun. I didn't have time to have fun. I had, like, time to make up, um, and I... Sorry, what was your question again? I what made you fall back in love with snowboarding? I think this year, being able to be stuck at home because I've never spent a season at home for in 10 years or more and seeing what's like just out my back door and like feeling like a re more relaxed feeling, getting to go sledding every day. Like I've always just wanted to go sledding. I love it, but I was always like feeling like I had to sneak out and do it. So I think um, riding powder and like finding out what riding – I don't know. I, I think like too when you get something taken away and then you get a taste of it back and you're like, wow. like I was so bummed on myself for not liking snowboarding. I checked out completely. I didn't want to fucking like when you were like name that video part. I was like, good luck in this one period of time I was out because I couldn't even look at it. Um, and that sounds crazy. But so I would just like mechanically go out, like huck myself off some shit and film it. And then that was it. Um, what made me fall back in love with it? I don't know. I think like also helping the girls with the movie and like feeling seeing that fire and seeing how stoked they'd be if I could like have a session with them and like remembering what a session was like 
You know what I hear from you when you talk about like snowboarding wasn't fun because I couldn't afford it to be because like whatever the verbiage you use for that. Uh, it, I I have so many. I don't want to say so many. I have a few friends I can think of that are very very high achieving in in the snowboarding world, and they are they put so much pressure on themselves. And what I wonder, do you think the amount of pressure you put on yourself is kind of the result of that? Like how the expectation? Yeah, for you sure. Have for yourself, for sure, for sure. Because it was all about the result and not the process. Um, I felt like I had to keep pushing and doing something crazier and all that. I mean, everyone feels that way. But me, because I felt like I had been given a special opportunity. Like I said, like there wasn't a lot of girls getting... I mean, there... Like, girls that were on Monster for... um, When they put together their street team or, like... You know, I had been given something that I couldn't waste and... Not only that, I felt like I needed to make sure everybody knew that I was bleeding for it every opportunity I had. So um, it was, yeah, the expectation of like the certain level of riding that I want to be doing and and earning what I had, making sure that I was, I could look back like on my deathbed and be like, I tried my hardest. Mm-hmm. That's a great perspective. I, a lot of times. But it's not healthy. No, it's not healthy at all. <laughs> but but those, those big contracts do come big expectation. Yeah. If you get signed to be the next big quarterback for a football team and you get a gigantic contract, the expectation is for you to win. And that, I don't know if that's the best analogy for snowboarding, but it's this kind of the same way. If you get signed and you get a big contract, when the team signs you, there's an expectation for you to perform. Absolutely. So I think, you know, it's something to think about, you know, maybe put yourself in somebody else's shoes and, and whatnot in regards to that stuff. So it's crazy cool. when I signed with North Face and I was like, I'm going to do the craziest shit ever. And they were like, you don't have to chill. And I was like, what? Like, and then I realized kind of maybe no one ever really told me, like, I told me. Yeah. I told me. And there's a, it's really hard, like, kind of transition to make after you've been pro for a long time to be like, oh, it's all of the things that I've done cumulatively make me who I am as, like, JP doesn't need to film another insane part, you know? But it's really hard to, like, tell yourself, like, you're good, just do things in other ways, like make the fucking sickest podcast in snowboarding, make some fucking sick movie, do do something else, as well as, like, keep snowboarding. But you don't have to die for it. You're just wasting your cartilage. Well, yeah, you think of the consumer, right? They're not going to ever be able to do what you've done. So North Face just needs you to be you, and the more you speak and do cool things like like, uh, MoFo did for you, that's what makes a difference, you know? That's what creates lifelong customers for them, is their representative went out and changed that person's life, you know? It's not as gnarly. You don't have to be as gnarly as people think, I guess. On the come up, you got to be to be noticed. Well, look at like I look at Chad Otterstrom. If I like, I will watch Chad Otterstrom do a McTwist on like a quarter pipe, and I'm just like, yes, yeah. Like that's it's, I don't it doesn't need to be high, it doesn't need to be big, it's, or like you know, or you know, JP does a cab two seventy on a rail. I'm like <laughs> that that gets me more psyched than a lot of the the stuff I see from people I haven't heard of and whatnot. For what, I don't you know, know when we were watching reason. Danny Cass at Recharge. Oh, God. Get like back that, to back That sevens. was it, right? Oh that was just God. like, woo. That's Get all it. I needed to see. Ben, not Ben Knight, Ben Bullock always is always trying to, like, put that in my head. Because he, I, like, I hire him every year to to work with me because, it, again, I don't want to take the risk of working with someone who I, is going to be a bitch ass. And uh, he's always like, don't, like, because I'm out, like, we'll build the jump, and then I'll be like, this is what I got to do, and I have to land it, or I fucking suck, and he'll be like, no, like, everyone can do this one trick, but no, no one can be you and do this one trick, and we're talking, like, a method, or, like, no one can poke an indie like you, and I'm like, do, is there really people out there who notice those, like, subtle nuances? Is there really people I, out there? Go ahead, yeah. But when you're, what you're saying about Chad and Danny, it's like, everyone in the world can do those tricks right now. But it's so special when you see them, and when you see them in real life, do it even, and you're like reliving your fucking childhood over. Hundred percent. Yeah, that's exactly like, it. Big fan of motocross. They, Ricky Carmichael does a course preview on the track, and he's not going nearly as fast as the fast guys, 
but I'm just like, yes, like, let's go, you know? And uh, going back to what you said about the nuances of the indie, I love in your film, I can't remember which video part it's from, you do an indie, but it's kind of like a nose high indie where you poke it. It's not like down. It's like up and tweaked to the to the side. And it's, I just remember thinking that like it, it is the subtle, like I was like, that was fucking incredible indie grab, you know? And um, I used to try to want to have at least five different ways to do an, an indie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sick. That's sick. <laughs> yeah, that's a true the the subtleties of refining your craft is what that is right there it seems like but beautiful so let's talk real quickly i know you don't have your setups with you cuz you're coming from mexico but uh for the people that are interested in what you ride uh, what board bindings outerwear all that stuff um i ride the capita equalizer which is my pro model board with capita and bindings I ride union bindings, but they're all, I, when I get my bindings, I look at the ones that I think like look the sickest and, and or, like the color that I like, cause they're all, I know that they're going to be good. I'm not just bullshitting that. Um, they yeah. always like right out of the box. I feel like they're great. I just have to make them smaller cause I got small feet. Outerwear. I just, well, I would ride anyways, but the North face free ride kit, which I like riding their stuff. And we did, uh, that's the thing that I was filming for this year, this video in that. And it was that, I don't know if you saw my Instagram, but there's like that white, white and black and yellow. The patches? Yeah. That kid is swag dad. Dude. I was thinking your whole, like that, you're looking like a female version of MFM in that thing. It looks dope. I love that. Thanks, dude. I I really want to like going back to the people's champ stuff, like a lot of stuff that high-end outerwear like it's rad when you get it for free but a lot of people can't afford that shit so i love representing Mm -hmm. like the like i don't know and i feel like the the lower end stuff sometimes is like way more bomb proof for someone who really like rips holes and shit um thicker fabric all that all that stuff so yeah the north face free ride kit i'm not sure the exact model of the jacket but i mean you're not gonna miss it when you see it it's the stormtrooper and then uh, what else is there? Got, I mean, let's run through everything. You got goggles. You got hats. Am I just naming a brand or am I? Well, you just just naming all your. I guess when we like to people oh, yeah. like to talk people about your board know. setups too. Yeah, okay, like, so you, Cole so. Cole Headwear. Um, I ride boots. Who will give people who will give me free boots? I will wear those boots. Um, goggles and helmets. Smith's been giving me some stuff for a couple of years. And what else is there? I mean, gloves, North Face. Perfect. Well, going back to setups, a lot of our listeners love knowing kind of how you set your board up angles. If you do anything particular with your edges. So like set back. Dance with. Set it back. So set back. Step back for rails. Set back for everything. And the years that go on, like I guess just keep going back and back. I'm going to be T-bolting my shit soon. Um, how far back are we talking? tail are we talking? What are we saying? <laughs> I mean, on like a... <laughs> like a <laughs> on like a directional twin board, like maybe like... Okay, for powder, more than three inches sometimes, than, yeah. Kind of max it out. Park, probably two inches. I like feeling when I'm riding into something switch that I'm actually riding fakie on a skateboard because I always sucked at skateboarding. But I want to feel that, like, closer to my tail so it, like, feels switch. I'm not trying to, like, mirror what I'm doing regular. Mm-hmm. Width is, like, I don't know, maybe 22. Like, I'm pretty short. Um, that feels good to me. And then I just... Uh, really, I just move my bindings around standing on my board, depending on how my knees are hurting that year. Um, <laughs> I'm serious. That's good advice. Until that you don't feel advice. any like twisting or pulling or whatever. So maybe like minus uh, f- plus 15 on the front minus pretty duck. Pretty duck. It's whatever the knees are allowing. Is for that the still season. a term, duck? Oh, that's it's a, a term. That's yeah. a term. Duck okay. foot. Yeah. Duck foot. Yeah. I'll tell you, sometimes I'm riding up the chairlift and I'll see a guy going down. That's like, it's like 20 negative 25 or like, it's like. And I'm just like, that guy's like, who set you Jesus up Christ. and ruined your experience? RIP to your MCL. MCL, ACL, meniscus. Yeah. So, and then what about edges? You keep those doggers sharp or? I don't really do anything. Like if I'm, I mean, I don't do a ra- rail trips anymore. So if I was, then yeah, I'd take them right off, right out of the box. But I, otherwise I just leave them as they are need something to grip onto the ice. I'm and always like, yes, I'm glad I didn't take my edges off. Would you say, let me just ask you, why do you prefer riding powder? Because it's new and fun for me and it doesn't involve as much suffering. It doesn't feel like, like there was, I got to a point in the streets where I was like, I don't know what else to do. 
I feel like whatever I do, however crazy it was, however many days it took me to land it, it goes by in like a split second. And, and I feel like people already have seen me do all this stuff that it has like, it, the, the crazier you get, the less impact it has. That's how it felt. So landing, and it's hard, dude. It's so hard. It's so like people, that's so cliche. People say, oh, riding powder is hard, but no, it's, it's really hard because you get so few tries when you're used to getting a hundred tries, unlimited tries at something. And you're like, literally I have three. Yeah. But, and then also just like the feeling of like surfing I've I'm still such a beginner at and I like want to turn so bad and like slash and whatever you know it brought me back to like oh my god I can do that on my snowboard I for, I like totally took snowboarding for granted and what I'm able to do like I may not be doing a back two seven on a kink rail or something but I know how to turn and this year I feel like I learned how to turn because I never yeah you look like you ripped at surfing to me Oh, thanks. Just like uh, you accelerated quickly, it seemed like. Yeah, and I, I mean, mean, I feel like everything you do, you probably do it like that. I rode on my knees for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> on the surfboard? Yeah, like by accident. Just feeling the wave pull you in, basically? Just like totally paralyzed with fear and uh, worried to let go of the board. When you're going too fast, I know what you're saying. Yeah. When you're like, yeah. No, 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 no
because this is what I hire him for. Mm -hmm. He's my filmer, but also like the guide and the coach. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like funny to, he's like invested Mm -hmm. in it. And same with when he's invested in anything that he does. And same with when he comes out with the girls to help with the uninvited, like it's the same thing. So, I mean, we have a really weird dynamic. I know it's fucking weird. I know it's weird, but now like he, he's been living in my house since for a long time, like as roommates, I don't know if you can have like platonic life partners, but that's us for sure. That's so cool. That's a great cool. dude. I have to say, I always got along great with him. And Me too. He would, he would do that even for some people hated it. I liked it, but he would always have great little tidbits of advice. Like remember hitting backcountry jumps with him and he'd be like, you need to wait a second to grab. And I'm like, okay. And then <laughs> yeah, like, his delivery is wrong. Yeah, like, but but you're like, no, but you, how it is. you do it and it would work. Yeah. He's, he's definitely, if you watch his, his video parts, he's done a lot of incredible tricks and his landing average is high and he knows, okay, this is how fast, this is how fast you go. You start from here and you're like, okay, perfect. And you hit the sweet spot. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing most of the time, but that's how it used to be. Buds, you got any more patrons? Because I, I think we start kind of I wrapping do. things up a little bit. We're going to go with this. This is kind of an absurd question that uh, we got. Oh, I like this one. Yeah. So don't uh, don't point fingers at us for this ridiculousness of this question. I'm just asking it because it's ridiculous. It's from Ryan Paul. <laughs> okay. Is it true that you started snowboarding at age 30 and told potential sponsors that you were much younger? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is what when I when I lost track on a question a while ago. Um, that's what I was thinking. I was like, oh yeah, Ben told me I need to bring this up. Um, so yeah, I know people, I did lie about my age. Oh, you, you, oh, you did do this. I okay. didn't start at 30. Yeah, 30, right? <laughs> You're like, I thought it was 13, 14. <laughs> and I mean, people can laugh at that for sure, but there was like, no, I thought I was going to have my like one chance and then I'm out and people were like, there's no way you will get anywhere if people know how old you are. I was 23. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I was 23 for a couple of years there. Um, but yeah, like I, I literally thought it was that or I'm not going to get a chance. There was already so many other reasons why I wasn't going to get a chance. Um, so yeah, I think I was 23 for like three years or something. And then I remember like going to lunch with Evan and his girl. And I was like, Evan, I have something to tell you. I'm not 23 or something. And he was like, so. But I was thought in my mind, like he was going to cut me. I think it's smart. I saw Chris Bradshaw do this long time ago and he started early, like, he, oh no way! He planned to have a long career, so very early in his career, he said he was younger than he really was, and then he was riding. And he grew for tech, into it. Yeah, and he grew into it, and then he's riding for Tech Nine, and we eventually got his uh, his ID to book him a ticket, and it was like five, six years. No off. way! Yeah. And because remember, he was like in a Mac Dog movie, way, way, way down the line. So he like just started early and planned to add. But imagine so I, if someone would have not given him the opportunity because they were like, oh, this guy isn't worth investing Yeah, like, in. we can't give this guy a three-year contract. He's already this old. Yeah, totally. So I think it's any pro. Why not? start yeah. Do it early so people don't know. I mean, also, or <laughs> just be who you are. And, I mean, it's easier to say that now because now it's it, – I think it is much easier to be who you are. But the people I don't realize and, like, I, that – Girls peak at, like, a, a later age. There's, like, a lot of girls in their 40s who are still really good. And um, it's, like, almost like you need more time to get over all that shit in your head and be like, no, 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 I, I'm good and I can do this. Like, look at Maria Thompson. I don't know anyone who's signed a Burton Global, their first Burton Global contract over 30, you know? Yeah. And there's no reason why they shouldn't. And, yeah, I just think... I mean, it's easy to say, like, don't judge people and whatever. But, yeah, that's that's what I did. No, I didn't start when I was 30. I started when I was 14, and I filmed that Think Tank part when I was 24 and got my first contract when I was 25. That's a big break in between from when you started, I guess, huh? Oh, God, dude. Don't, we're not going to – let me sum this up real quick. <laughs> um, I lost a good couple of years in there. I – got this shitty doctor, got into some stuff and um, ended up having like a pretty bad mental health crisis where they misdiagnosed me with schizophrenia, put me in a program that I like had basically no freedom and was like tranquilized on antipsychotics, all this shit. And like my life went from like being about snowboarding to just having someone like come to my door and watch to make sure I took my medication and being in this fucking group of where I wasn't allowed to use the cheese grater at taco night because it was all like, uh, it was, it was nuts. 
it was a couple years of my life. Those years that I thought that were the ch- my chance to make it. It was between like I guess nineteen to twenty two, um, and the doctor was like, "Don't even think about." the snowboarding thing, like, you're not even going to go back to that. Just try to get off disability and, like, take your medication and live a life. So when I moved to Whistler and I finally got away from that, like, I had kind of escaped from that program. I totally escaped from that program. You were, like, trapped, huh? Yeah, and got myself off a lot of the medication. Still on some of it to this day because the withdrawal is just so fucking gnarly. And because, yeah, I have depression and it needs treatment. It needs more treatment than Namaste can fucking treat me with. (laughs) Um So when I moved to Whistler, I had already this feeling that, like, these years have been stolen from my life. And when people were like, you're not, you're too old to make it, I wanted to be like, but I, it's different. Like, I, you know, I was really pissed at that. So I was like, that's another reason why I was like, fuck you, I don't care. So, like, yeah, everyone that laughed at me flying about my age, because I remember people, like, people knew when they would make fun of me for sure or like mention it I mean of course they would I fucking knew about other people's dumb shit and I would make fun of them um (laughs) but there was it 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 goes beyond just like trying to scam my way in there it was like I felt like I had gotten the most important years stolen from my life and if that's all that was going to stand between me and my dream after thinking for so much that I'm just going to be basically an invalid um in a home for the rest of my life Fuck yeah, I'd lie about my age, do whatever it takes. You know, fuck those doctors. Fuck those, dude, fuck those doctors for just quickly just writing a script. Well, they want the money and, from the and prescription and business. And that's. I guess I would use this opportunity to say this, maybe. Um, how that whole thing started was I kept going to the doctor f- with really bad stomach pain, being like, I feel really sick all the time. I can't eat anything. And he just kept giving me different things for different stomach things or doing blood tests. And looking back now, I know that it was, like, anxiety and depression, for sure. Um, And then one day, he was like, here, take this. I think that, like, you should try these antidepressants. And I was like, antidepressants? What the fuck's that? He had these sample packs. And so they didn't have, like, the whole warning or anything on them. I started taking them. I took them for a couple weeks. This is, like, the absolute worst thing that can happen. And they don't even prescribe this medication anymore because it's so dangerous if you stop taking it, if you even miss a dose. And I was... uh, Working at a skate shop at the time, I kept going in the back being like, oh, my God, I'm going to puke. I didn't want anyone to know that or see that So, because the side effects were so bad when I started. So I just stopped taking them. And a few days later, I had, like, this major psychotic break that that's what they would call it. But And they took that as, like, oh, you're schizophrenic and swooped in with all their shit. But really, it was just – and I, it took me years, years and years, maybe, like, just the past couple of years that I realized that that's what caused this whole thing in the first place. So – A lot of people, like, hate on medication. For me, like, it took until this year for me to finally get my shit dialed. But just don't stop taking psychiatric medication suddenly. Don't do that. You'll fucking... You don't go cold turkey. Don't go cold turkey, no. There's no such thing as as that. Don't do that. And I wish someone would have told me that. Because I almost died. Is it a benzo? Do you know if it's a benzo? No, it was it was an SSRI. Because okay. I know benzos, you can die quickly from from withdrawal. Yeah, from as well. withdrawal. Too oh, they had me on headaches. all that shit. And, and doctors like to overprescribe. And yeah, you know the statistic I heard the other day is sixty uh, percent of the world's pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals are consumed by the United States. That's no way. Sixty percent of the world's. Wow. So and. and whatever not to hijack this conversation but like i guess it's that's I'm important saying. to look but at it, it is an important stat yeah. and what i i think not to devalidate people there are there are pills that are are needed are fucking absolutely needed for us to survive there's no doubt about some pharmaceuticals are 120 percent necessary but they're not the solution for everything and so like i'd say yeah just i don't know think about that if Somebody's whatever. It's just an Shane Charlebois just got the hip replacement. Mm-hmm. Went in there and they're like, "You're gonna have to take all these oxycotton." Shane's like, "I'm not taking one oxycotton. I've seen too many lives get ruined." And the doctor was just like, "No, you you have to take these. You're gonna really regret mm-hmm. if you don't." And he's like, "I'm not touching those. I'm not taking them home." And the doctor's like, "Listen, just take them home. Someone's gonna want these." No way, doctor. I mean, he's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's like, oh. You, so and Shane like flipped out on a dude like hey you want one of my friends to get these and yeah. then they're addicted and it's like this is a problem you know it's a yeah they can't be doing that 
Another interesting thing to talk about, though, is like uh, the antidepressant thing. I know, like, Leah, my girlfriend's like very kind of holistic, we'll say. And she was on antidepressants for a very long time. And she just wanted to come off of them. And she was able to wean herself off and found some other natural whatever, which I'm not saying is the way. But some of her friends tried and said, you know what? I don't like this. I'm go- I'm going to stay on. So, but there's just some just an option for some people to pursue if needed. Okay, I'm going to say something else then. Yeah. Because I feel like it's hard for me still to be like, yeah, I'm on medication. Like I had I hit fucking rock bottom after I saw the film for the first time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I hit rock bottom last summer, and cry. I was like, <laughs> I hit the cry button. Um, I was like, I'm fucking out, dude. I can't do this anymore. I've tried everything, but. Because I know what it's like to be left behind and how fucking stupid that decision could be. I was like, hey, here's the thing. I'm going to try all the things that I always said would not work. And then if, I, if and then when I prove myself right, because obviously I'm fucking right, then I can go. So I went back to my doctor and like insisted that I see an actual psychiatrist, not just a fucking family doctor, because I had been on this medication for like 15 years that, and it just wasn't working, but I couldn't get off it. And, and I did went and finally saw a counselor and stopped saying, oh, I don't need to pay someone to listen to my problems. You know, that fucking thing. All the shit, I'm going to stop smoking weed. I'm going to stop everything. Do all the things that I'm supposed to do. And, and, and man, it fucking saved my life. Like, I, I, got, I found a psychiatrist. Like, I was really lucky to find one that was like, no, you don't need to, like, we just need to, like, deal with this depression. You have all these other factors coming in. The head injuries, the drug use in the past and I like switched we like switched things around and I was so scared to like change anything or try anything and I realized that she like she she was like all depression is treatable and I was like are you no it's not like you don't know me because I you know everyone thinks they're different but it took a really shitty um period of getting off the other shit and like a shitty period of getting on the new shit um they have new things. There's new things that are happening that people, doctors don't eat. Your doctor, your family doctor might not even know about right now. And that, like, I got to a place where, like, it still sucks because I know I'm, all my friends are hippies and holistic and everything, and it sucks feeling like you're doing the chemical thing, you know? But it's like, for some people, it works, but don't do it half ass. I got a lot of friends who were like, oh, I tried that, didn't work. And I'm like, wait, you mean like you tried it or I tried that and made it worse. I'm like, you mean you tried it and you stopped like, hold on. If you're, if you're going to go that route, like go at it with all your heart and try to prove, try it, just try for once to prove yourself wrong. I know that medication is not for everyone. And this is different for me being from Canada. It's similar to the States, but it's not like, like, I feel like everyone here when I, that I would talk to is like, yeah, have some shit going on. But um, for me, it got me, I had, and that's another, th- when you say, like, what made you fall in love with snowboarding again? I was like, I'm not getting into this. But, <laughs> like, wanting to be alive again for the first time in, like, since Mark died. <laughs> I never knew, like, I still, like, have really hard days. And look at me, like, I fucking just cried for four hours, but... You don't have to fucking suffer your whole life. And I wish I would have known that. I wish I would have, like, valued myself enough or had the balls enough to go look for help and not take no for an answer. So if you're thinking about peacing out, at least try all the things first. And don't try them trying to fuck it up. Try them... I'm not saying like medication, but I'm saying like therapy or talking to someone or holistic things or whatever it is, like show yourself that you matter. And on that, I know that we've gone way overboard here. No, we haven't. Uh, Over time. Our listeners want to hear this and they they hit us up about it and it's important. Okay. One thing about like suicide, and I hate even that word because it's just like another buzzword right now. How crazy is that, you guys? Where the (laughs) fuck? Um, I want everyone out like we all have like thoughts about ourselves and how we value ourselves and how like sometimes we're just like oh fuck this like 
I think everyone has those thoughts. Um, when I saw, like, when I was having another, like, tough time recently, and when the teaser came out for Learning to Drown, or, like, when I put the Uninvited movie out and, like, got that huge response, not that I'm, like, looking for that those dopamine hits, but, like, all these people, like, DMing me being, like, this is so important to us, this is this, like, thank you for doing this, whatever, and I'm, I was, like, surprised, like, oh, fucking, someone gives a shit about me, like, I, and that's me who's famous in the snowboarding world, and everybody feels like they don't matter at times, and I would ask, like, anyone to just remember something, and I'm talking to myself here, too, right now, think about someone that you've lost, and think about if that person could come back. And, and think about the reaction of that. Everyone's fucking devastated. People are ruined over it. They're fucking ruined. <laughs> and if you ask that person to come back and we're like, dude, look at, look at the response. Look at the actual impact you had on other people around you. We have no idea. But would that person say, like, if, if you could go back in time, would that person say, oh, yeah, everyone's going to care. Everyone's going to be ruined over this. No, they're going to be like, I don't fucking matter. We all matter. We all, like, and, and by the time you find that out, it's too late and you're not even here to see it. That's just... That's so true. ...what I'd say to people. Yeah, think of, yeah that's incredible. Think about, it, like, the, when you go to a funeral and... People are fucked. It's yeah. just in... The ones left behind have it the hardest. I think in every, how, many, how much the effect, uh, everybody's affected, and it's super powerful foresight and it's the perspective and... Uh, and and also like going back like they, we need to normalize the fact that if you're having a hard time don't internalize that shit go talk to somebody go work on yourself and i love what you said earlier like actually try actually try to prove yourself wrong cuz this is an interesting i was reading this book it's fucking awesome i recommend it to anybody it's mark or it's not mark manson it's uh ryan holiday ego is the enemy and one of the points of this book that hit me like a ton of bricks, he talks about we would rather be right than happy. So if your narrative is this would happen to me, this is exactly something that would happen to me. Like so when something goes wrong, you're validating your ego. You're, you, it's validating the fact that, see, bad things always happen. And you see this? And you, in, in that case, you'd rather be right than happy. In the sense when you apply that in the same sense to like – Oh, like my, my, my clinical depression is harder than everybody else's. I just, there's nothing that's going to work instead of trying to prove yourself wrong. You, every time something doesn't work, you're validating your ego. You're validating yourself being right. You're validating instead of trying to like, I love that, that that's put your ego in the box. Let's not, let's not go with the, this exact narrative and let's try to prove ourselves wrong and find something that works. I, that's I, that just hit me like hard. I, I love that. That's so. heavy, dude. Yeah. I love. I like that too. And I mean, I love like having this conversation because there's been times like I've been listening to the podcast and like you guys get close to something and I'm like, no, keep going, keep talking, and then <laughs> like, back off. Yeah. yeah, like we're not. I just want to say I'm glad you made the right decision. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And you're with us. <laughs> Me too, man. Me and you too. know what? Let's Fuck. send that super air horn out to everyone we've yep. lost. Yep. Special air horn. <laughs> It's an interesting topic with the podcast because it's you want you wonder like where how deep do you go till people are are like that's too much you know and I love talking about this type of, this type of stuff but I hate when it's preachy so like I try to like you know you you don't want to preach but you don't want to come off like oh I'm, I fucking read books like I hate like the intellectual ego that people have that they read like I'm I'm new to reading and I'm just discovering like I want your book list <laughs> reading and stuff and so. Yeah, there's a lot of great books. Another thing going back to, to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier, like as far as things that have helped me out in hard times, there's a book called uh, Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It. And it's about a guy who went through a horrific breakup and, and you know, was suicidal and the, the tools he used to break through that. And, that, and you know, it's, it's so easy to speak so negatively towards yourself the way we speak to ourselves is shit we would never say to another person out loud well you'd never be friends with someone that talks to you like that right yeah and like learning how to change that like you don't need to be so fucking hard on yourself like you know i love I, i've 
talked about it before, but like when I was getting sober, I'm almost five years sober now. I talk about it a lot. I'm sorry. It's boring. Shouldn't you press the button? I'll, I'll give myself an air horn for that. <laughs> but like when I first was trying to quit dr drinking and doing drugs, I was, uh, I would, I would fall on my face a lot. Like I would like go out, I would get like three weeks and then I'd have some blowout bender where, where I was out till whatever time in the morning. And so my sister said the best words to me. She's like, don't be so hard on yourself. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and try again. No big deal. And I was like, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, no big deal. But instead, you're like, I'm such an asshole. I'm such a piece of shit. I shouldn't have done that. You know, or yeah, what? I knew it. I'm fucking useless. I'm useless. I knew I wouldn't do it. I knew I wouldn't come through with it. No, like, dude, it takes like five or six tries sometimes, or 10 or 11, or even you get five years and you go back out, and that's okay. But I don't know. Learning to like, be kind to ourselves. I, I don't know. It's just an interest. I, th I think that that is the the key to life, but it's way easier said than done. And I think a lot of people aren't even there yet to to even th to, to believe that that's what it is. Here, here's an inverse flip of that, though. I always feel like if we were really kind to ourselves, we wouldn't have some of the greatest athletes ever. Because I swear some of that negative self-talk and that oh, all of it is is the driving force fuels the drive to want to be great well how about this if you just like loved yourself and thought you were rad then why would you try to get good at something why would you try to, i heard something somewhere that like um i was reading this like book on buddhism and it was like why are people why aren't we just like why are we here to be why do we have these like drives and this self shit talk and all this stuff? Like if this is how things are and like the ultimate universe is love and all that stuff, then, and we don't need to change. We just are great as we are. Why, why do humans act this way? And someone was like, well, if that was the case, then like literally life would not happen. Nothing would ever get done. Um, it's a good point. I'm not like pushing for this, but I remember thinking, Oh wow. Yeah. Like, cause if everyone was just like, uh, like how would, food be made <laughs> you know if people were like i'm beautiful right here i'm not going out to plow the fields you know you know it's but what you're describing is a sense of purpose i think too we, yeah. need, we need a sense of a purpose and a sense of a reason to do things and and fuck that's what's great about snowboarding is that we like for us and it, for so many years it was the it gave me a reason to get out of bed in the morning and you're like f like and and it's it, it kept me in the summer. I party like a maniac because I I've lost my sense of purpose. So I would go bender after bender because I didn't have that thing. A winter, okay, I got my purpose back. But if you if you lose that, it's it's hard. It's it's hard to say though because when I, when I now as I get older, the people I admire aren't necessarily the people that are that hate themselves so much that the the greatest to ever do it. But it's the it's the people that seem to have inner peace. I like I I want that I more want than that too. I want that <laughs> more than I want the Mofo, fucking give it to me. trophy. Yeah, like of uh, you know that's an interesting topic, but. We kind of kept going while you were digging a Wiz Khalifa. But I, I mean, I think uh, it, you just can't go black and white, like either totally enlightened and I love myself and everything's great and then I'm a fucking pile of shit. Um, I think there's like, there can be, a lot of us are more on the I'm a pile of shit side of things. But I mean, just having moments where you're like, just you're you're going to put energy into like fighting off that that feeling of like, okay, just like give myself one break here, you know? It starts with that. It's not like don't just give up because you didn't become the fucking Buddha, you know. Mm -hmm. Talking to myself here too. No, this is this is great. I think also going back to like it's good to to be able to have that that competition in you sometimes too, and that that as I like to call it that fuck you. Like you need that like that spiteful fuck you and just kind of like to pull that out and and get to a different level at times, but but be able to recognize it for what it is. I think the fuck you could even be classified as like a type of self-love because you're like proving your worth. Mm. Not that you should have to prove yourself to anything, but like you're doing that not for someone else. You're doing that for you. Like when you're left and you get, you have no fucks left to give about what people think and you're just like, I'm going to go, yeah, down in flames. <laughs> That's something for yourself too, to be like, I know that I'm, worth, these guys don't give a shit about me, but I know that I'm worth something. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Absolutely. Self-worth. I love what you're talking about earlier. You were mentioning like kind of finding that sense of belief in somebody before they had it 
themselves. I, I feel like I had kind of had some mentors like that growing up a little bit. And it's so powerful when somebody's like, you're not even sure if you can do it, but there's somebody else like, no, dude, you're sick. You got this. And that's such a huge thing to kind of help somebody find their confidence and find their belief in themselves. And it's just such like, you know, I, I, I love this, this topic of, of deeper stuff because it's, it's not, it's not like one day you wake up and you just have confidence and you have belief in yourself. It It's a series of small steps incrementally. Like what you do on a micro level gets you to where you go on the macro. It's as, it's as simple as like every day trying get like the, the making a habit of getting outside your comfort zone is like really what it is like becoming, making it a pattern. Like, okay, I'm going to step outside my comfort zone every fucking day. I'm going to, and what do you, do you have anything to add to that topic at all? No, I mean, you said it great. This is all the stuff I wanted you to go get off on. comfortable being uncomfortable, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And don't be afraid to try to prove yourself wrong. Just check because you can always go back to whatever dumb thing you were doing. Mm -hmm. But check it out. It might change your life. It might save your life. It might yeah. make your life so much better. Totally. God. Well, sweet. To be great, you got to take these steps mm -hmm. or else you're never even going to know what you can achieve. Absolutely. 100%. And also, it's not even about achievement, too. And to fucking, it's like achievement, but like I, I get really caught up on like achievement, success. But Dude, it's like, me too. I know. Well, but achievement like, could be achieving a dope method, or true. I, I'm the guy that put people on Mars first. I mean, they're mm -hmm. all achievements on your own personal level. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So maybe it's the wrong word, but. Okay, we have one final guest question. And this is from one of your uh, mentorees. Is that a word? Mentors. Yes. She's the mentor. I actually think it's mentees. Oh, mentees? mentees? This is from, I don't know. Is it Mentos? This is it's from, Mentos. One of my Mentos. This is from the fresh maker, Mentos. <laughs> More with birds. Hi, guys. What's up, Jess? It's Kalia here. I don't actually have a guest question. I just wanted to say that you have been my biggest inspiration in snowboarding since day one. I remember just watching every video you have ever uploaded on the internet a million times. I know the back tail blew everyone's mind and think thing, but then you followed it up with the switch front board and a back went on. It was mind blowing. Every part you have ever put out is literally been so legendary. I could go trick after trick. I remember this one time you uploaded a video of you at Hood showing how you were living out of your truck and I just wanted to see more. I wish that you would just upload videos every day. I would search your name daily to see if you uploaded anything new and yes, I'm actually still like this. I literally watch your snowboarding on repeat. I wanted to do what you were doing. I've always known that and I wanted to become pro snowboard just like you. But meeting my childhood snowboarding hero and having you become such a huge role model in my life, it means so much to me. You have become so much more than my snowboarding idol. You have become so much more to everyone in snowboarding. I'm very grateful to call you my friend. You have inspired me in so many ways throughout my life and my snowboarding career. I really just want to say thank you. That was nice. That's very sweet. It's crazy. What she is saying is exactly what MoFo was to me. I'd be searching for, I would like search her name on all the everything. So that's really cool to know that. I mean, I know people say that, but I always think people just say that to me because they're in front of me and they're, that's what you're supposed to say to whatever pro snowboarder you're around, you know? Um, thanks, Kalia. S speaking with her, we were, we were kind of, first of all, her car is broken down in Nebraska oh, and she, she had a leak in her gas tank and uh, <coughs> she is totally chill. I, I've never actually spoken or talked to Kalia before. And I was like, she's fucking awesome. And uh, she just totally, and we, as we were speaking though, like she couldn't come up with a question. She could just, the sentiment and the authenticity and the genuine, like respect and Im positive impact you had on her life. She just kept reiterating. Like I, we, she, everything she said just, and I was like, why not? Instead of doing a question, let's just, why don't you just say that? It doesn't need to be a question. Just say what you're saying to me right now. And so, um, I thought that was really cool. And, and, um, I've, yeah. So honestly, you know. until she, like, I still, it's so weird. Are you just always tell yourself like, nah, you know, default to the negative, but until she like named the, all the tricks on the ledge, I was like, oh, okay, you actually did watch the part, but yeah, I know that I can, yeah, I remember every single thing MoFo ever did too. So thanks Kalia. That gives me some purpose. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. What you're doing 
does have a good impact on people's life, you know? And uh, I know you have a couple other things about you know, uninvited you wanted to bring up. Um, yeah, I mean, hopefully I will have my uh, meme uh, meme announcements dialed by the time this episode drops. But um, I've actually been working this winter on producing The Uninvited Three. Figured I would make it a trilogy. Every time I make one, I'm like, I'm not doing that again because I'm doing... The, w- the reason we're able to make it on such a small budget is because I do all the things that you would normally have to pay someone to do for free. like the. Um, but because I'm lucky enough to have spare time because I'm a pro snowboarder. The level, it's like, it's almost like I can't say no because the level is just like there came, like the last one was cool. There was girls that had breakout parts, but there's other girls that still need to be seen that are like, And other girls that just, yeah, they're, this isn't what I wanted to say about it. I'm making the uninvited three. It's dropping this fall. It's going to be fucking sick. I really think like, I liked how the last one we didn't really talk about till the teaser dropped or whatever. And this one probably going to be a little silent, save for some memes until the teaser drops. But I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be better than the last one. And I think people are going to be really surprised what's out there and hopefully the, sponsors pick up on it and see what they have on their hand let's see what's sitting right in front of them so yeah I mean before I wanted to clarify something too though the first movie I completely paid for myself and um the last one I had help like all my sponsors kicked in and it's so sick because I don't even really have a part in it but they like they believe in what what I'm this is part of what I do now is try to help people and they believe in it enough to like fund it. And then this one, the third one is also like fully funded. And I still like send money to people if they're struggling and they just need to get through the film trip or gas money for this or whatever. Um, and I'm definitely willing to spend my own money on it, but it's really fucking, I don't want to say vindicating, but like it's really fucking sick to see companies not just come in with like their intention and like oh that was cool I care about that but like throwing down money from their marketing budget so that I can actually like pay these the the filmers and buy shots off them and send the girls on trips and like book the Airbnbs and all that little all those little things are other indications without actually saying it in words that like you guys matter and someone believes in you I'm curious as to what you have next on the horizon for um, the People's Champ, a.k.a. Jess Kimura's future plans. Um, I mean, just keep doing what I'm doing, but exponentially expand on it. I just want to, I mean, use this time that I'm here to do good things um, and to share what I have with other people. And at first that was just like my snowboarding. I was trying to share with other people and the, now it's just in a different form. I want to keep riding pow, sledding a bunch, and um, yeah, just keep on snowboarding because I like it again. Beautiful. Well, we we want to see you keep boarding. Yeah, we want to we want to patiently wait to see the clips. And uh, you know, one thing we like to ask before we wrap this up: Do you have anybody you'd like to thank before we put a bow on this thing? I mean, I have so many people I want to thank, um, but. There, it's too long a list right now. So just uh, read the credits in Learning to Drown once it comes out. Make sure you guys watch this. It will, it's special. It is a special, special, special film. And it's not, there's no bullshit there. It's fucking awesome, Jess. When's that going to be dropping for the people? I am not entirely sure yet. And that's something a lot of people are asking. Um, but it's going to be this year sometime before awesome. the year is done. I'm hoping by December. I'll tell you what, my wife hasn't snowboarded a day in her life, and I was watching that last night just for research. She was riveted. I Everyone so, should watch it with yeah. their wife, their girlfriend. I think there. it's going to, like he said, transcend snowboarding. And You're going to be real famous, not just snowboard I, famous. That's not what I'm... People's, <laughs> people's moms are going to be anxiety. talking about you. In the oh. good way, though, I mean... In, in, a, in a way that has need. a positive impact, yeah. not in like a celebrity kind of way, but in yeah. a way that's it's going to be bigger than... It is bigger than our little nucleus of snowboarding you know we're all bigger than our nucleus but we just don't know it yet i still don't know it we'll see well beautiful i want to say thank you for coming on the show 
Really appreciate it. Thanks traveling. for having me. It's been a pleasure. So stoked to have you. This is one of my favorite conversations I've yes. ever had in my life, on or off air. So, so thank hey, you. sorry I cried so much, you guys. Not just you guys, but everyone out there that's going to be really uncomfortable watching me be like, and then I went on a film trip. I <laughs> think they're going to relate. People okay. want to see real emotions. All right. Well, fuck. I'm chock full of those. You know, I asked you if you're uh, if if he had ever come to you in your dreams. Reason I brought that up is uh, I believe you can manifest that and get them to come to your dreams in their own time because they go through time differently than us. And uh, my wife last week had a dream about J2. He, no uh, way. he was living in an apartment and caught a possum. And it became like it was living in the house with him. And this is something only J2 would do. And my wife's like, can I, can I pet it? Is it cool? And he's like, yeah, pet it. Pets it, and it fully attacked her. And J2 was like, what do you expect? It's a possum. And then just started cackling at her. And I woke up to her telling me the story, and I'm like, fucking twos. Did you ever, did you ever watch the Justin Benny episode? Yes. He J2 knocked something off the shelf when we brought his name up. Yeah, we brought his name up, and something fell off the back wall. <laughs> but yeah, only twos would, I actually listened to would it. get a possum. Watch it. That exact yeah. time when we brought him up, we were talking about him, just literally something fell down on the buds. Like, what the fuck? Fucking dude, amazing, happens? dude. Yeah. So dope. Well, I just want to say thank you guys for listening and tuning in each and every week. It means the world to us. And um, we'll see you next week. Over and out from the bomb hole.